This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Four hundred episodes. Today marks my four hundredth episode. Four hundred episodes. Anyone inspired enough to program that much content, this many guests? Well, they either have to be a really cool person or slightly insane or a combination of both. I will just put that out on the table as food for thought. My guest today, well, actually, he's not my guest today, not my live guest today. My guest today is Tom Basso. Tom has appeared on my podcast four times. I think they're four of the most popular episodes that I've had on my show. And today, on my 400th episode, I would like to play all four of Tom Basso's podcast episodes back to back to back to back with a bonus. The bonus is the very first excerpt I'm going to play is from sometime, I believe, in the early to mid-1990s at an event where Tom was speaking at. You will find that Tom is very consistent. His message has not changed. I hope you enjoy this extremely long episode, my longest ever, with Tom Basso. Jack wanted us to talk on elements of successful trading, so I tried to think of what is it that creates successful trading, and I think Mark mentioned some of the things. I know Market Wizards 1 was, is one of my top three favorite books of all time because if nothing else, uh, when you read that book, you clearly figure out that there's uh, as many different people as there are in the book, many different ideas of how to trade as there are in the book, different markets, different systems. It can't be any one thing, and as Mark indicated, and I'm sure Bill would agree even, uh, there isn't one single holy grail out there that just uh, does it for you. So I tried to look at the common characteristics. What is it that we have to do as traders to be successful every day of our lives? It seems to break down for me into three areas, and, and you know, from least to most important, I would list them as follows. The least important area is the one that most people spend time on, and that's where do we buy, where do we sell? Call it the, uh, the strategy, if you want to put a name on it. You have to know where you're going to buy, where you're going to sell, or when you're going to buy, when you're going to sell. If you don't have a clue as to how you're going to do that, you're going to have a heck of a time going through life and just having things hit you over time. Uh, you're going to tend to increase your uh, amount of... Uh, erratic nature, you're going to have good days and bad days, and you're going to be all over the map probably. All of us have a strategy probably, whether it's you know, you're cyclical or whether you're a fundamentalist or whether you're, you know, breakouts or whatever you want to do. It doesn't make any difference, I don't think. I think the important thing is that you have something. And I think as Jack indicated, and I, um, and I couldn't agree more, uh, it, it really helps a whole lot to have it suit you. I mean, if you, if you don't have a million dollars, don't design a million dollar trading system. If you don't know anything about computers, don't go out and buy a computer package and try to run it. Uh, either that or you better get on a program to learn computers. In other words, try to develop the strategy that you're going to use to fit you. It makes it so much easier. I think the next up on the importance list, and very critical, and we heard a lot about it from uh, John Hill's uh, presentations this morning, is money management. If you don't have some way of saying, and that's what Mark's talking about, money management, you've got to be able to deal with, so you're going to have losses. If you, don't, if you don't have losses, you're not taking any risk probably, you're probably not going to make any reward. Losses are part of the game. How to deal with them is very, very critical. If you ignore them, they will come to haunt you. Uh, I like to limit all of our positions and futures, for instance, to a set percent of equity. 
I'm willing to risk that much. I always know that if my equity is going down, I'm in a drawdown. I'm committing less and less. As I'm running up, I'm automatically compounding my profits. It gives me a sensible way to not stick my neck out. I can come back and play the game again tomorrow. It also allows me to do one other thing. I can come in every day and I know that all my positions are a certain percent of equity. And the day that the Jack was referring to where the crude oil had gone all over the map overnight, by the end of the day or, or you know, as soon as we came in, our risk in the crude oil positions was exactly the same as it was the day before. It tends to help you as a person keep each day somewhat like the previous day. But if you ignore it, it comes to haunt you. This is the problem, I think, um, with a lot of the simulation software, a lot of the black boxes, the so-called holy grail systems that are advertised. A lot of them will deal with, say, one contract. We'll buy one contract, sell one contract, and it, it, it adds up to this much profit after the end of the next five years. The problem with that is in real life, as those profits build up, you have a tendency to have to compound those profits. If you don't build that into what you're doing, then doing your historical simulations and what you intend to do in the future don't even match each other. So you're going to get different results. And that, that's kind of a, almost a pointless exercise. Include your money management right in your simulations and really think a lot about being able to come back and play the game again. I think that's very important. The last one and the most important of all, and it's the one that probably people spend the least time with, is, uh, is looking in the mirror and understanding yourself. If you, if you really look at trading, I think, and, and uh, you alluded to it in your comments on most traders, you'll find that a lot of traders will match up very well to whatever their personalities are. You got a guy that's impatient, it's amazing how he becomes a short-term trader. Somebody that uh, wants excitement, can't get to Las Vegas on the weekend, boy, <coughs> the markets will provide him all the excitement he wants. There's also any personality trait that you have that, that might uh, be exploited by the market uh, against you, the markets have a wonderful way of doing that for you. So be careful what you wish for because you might get it. In knowing yourself, I think of three major things that uh, can really help your efforts in becoming a better trader. One is that self-confidence is, is extremely important in trading. If you have a lack of self-confidence about either yourself or your trading systems or strategies, it seems to me that the markets will tend to exploit that in you. You'll end up you know, being nervous about a, a drawdown period. Uh, you'll, you'll let go of what you're doing and go on to some you know, next best idea that is just one more uh, example of something that's about ready to fall apart. And you'll just wander around aimlessly frustrated over the whole thing. And, and I think self-confidence uh, goes a long way to giving you that courage to stick it out through some of the tougher periods. I think awareness of yourself is very useful. If you can either detach yourself or be aware that you're getting excited, you know, about making too much money, you know, that can be a problem. You get too excited or you get too emotionally set one way, markets are going up and you're long and you're just, you know, you're just making a hand over fist. It may cloud your judgment on being able to limit your losses when it comes time to pull a plug on that. You may stay a little too long, you may give up the profit. So being aware of what's going on inside your head is a very uh, interesting thing to think about. And the more you can be aware of what's going on inside of you as a trader, the better off you'll probably be. And then the last thing I'd mention is to think about a state of mind that's something like balanced. In every trade that you decide to do, there's probably some good points and some bad points to think about. There's some reasons why it would go up or go down for that matter. The more you can, you can kind of um, balance those out, I think the better chance you have at, at uh, being flexible and not getting married to a trade and, and finding something going against you, cut it loose, it's not a big deal. You can, you can constantly be changing your mind about things and keeps you flexible, keeps you uh, with the ability to survive. <clears throat> and the last thing I'd say about trading, and it kind of wraps it all up, and it's a saying that I kind of repeat to myself frequently, so in the hopes of maybe that you would like to repeat it to yourself, I think this could apply to, um, I, I say that this applies to not only trading, but probably life, and certainly to golf, uh, which I'm an avid uh, a fan of. And that's to concentrate on the process and let the results take care of themselves. What that means is 
being a trader has a lot of little things that we do every day as traders to be successful. And some of them are very unglamorous. Uh, the, the view of people have of, of traders is probably different from what really trading is if you really sat down and followed me around all day or any of uh, the rest of the panel. So concentrating on doing these little things right, that tends to help the results uh, uh, be just fine. To reiterate, get a strategy, watch your risk and volatility, and make sure you come back and play the game again, and look in the mirror and understand yourself. And with that, I wish you the best of uh, luck in your trades. If you as a trader have a certain comfort level or a certain strategy that you're using, I don't care what's fundamental, technical, systems trader, whatever, and if you, uh, there's only a certain amount, as Bill indicated, that you can pull out of a market that year and that means you're flat for the year, then a good trader says, well, that's what I pulled out of it and I'm flat. I think if, if on the other hand, there's hundreds of percent to be had and you make hundreds of percent, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've had, that you've done a good job trading. Profits and losses are not good trading, bad trading. Good traders are, concentrating on the process and, and whatever their slant on it is, and whether they're, they're trading one market or many markets, they are staying true to whatever they're doing. And then as the market changes, uh, it, it allows them to pull more or less out of it, you know, to, to match their style. I'd, I'd lump both of what they're saying into money management, which as I indicated is very important. and. If you don't have something involving that, whether it's stops or whatever Jack's doing, it's tough. You might walk in one day and find out that you can't trade today because you're out of money. I guess uh, I would agree with them, but I'd, I'd qualify it in the following way. Uh, I'd give you more maybe the positive side of what to do about it. If you can match what you're going to do, and don't say system, but strategy instead, because you could be a fundamentalist or a systems trader or whatever. Whatever that is, if you can match it to you, you're going to have a much better chance of success. Now, what are the odds of you going and buying that fancy black box for $2,000 or whatever and having it match you? I mean, for starters, you may not even know what's inside of the thing. First time it has a down week or a down month, you're going to be nervous. It's, it's going to maybe, uh, what, what happens if it goes through, as John Hill was showing us this morning, some systems that are very successful over time, they'd have two years straight of flat profits. But that's normal. That's expected. It wasn't broken. And in fact, over the time period, it made a lot of money. But if you're sitting there, you don't even understand that, then you're not going to have the, uh, the, the psychological side to stay with it. You're kind of setting yourself up for a lot of frustration, potentially. And if you sp spent the same amount of time and money just sitting down saying, what do I want to do myself? What's my way of looking at things? Then it's going to fit you, and you're going to do it, and you're going to be a lot more successful at it. Commented. I said something else that occurred to me. A lot of these systems have another, and I'll add in the system writers of the world, and most of the like the meta stocks. A lot of the um, the software that develops systems, you'll find a lot of them are dealing with one contract lots or constant contract lots. If you just do that, and you tend to ignore the money management systems that we all talked about and they talked about this morning in the panel, you're going to tend to set yourself up for having difficulties in actual trading. You'll know where to buy, where to sell, but you won't answer the question of how much do I want to buy, how much do I want to sell. These systems don't tend to get into a lot of that. It's a big danger. And you, you're, when the systems start addressing those issues or when, when the trading software start addressing more of those issues, you, know, you may feel a little more comfortable with it. I, I would agree with Jack, though. I, I would have no intentions of selling our software. I'm sure these guys have better things to do than to, to, to sell that. Are you trading for yourself or for others? For yourself. The answer to that, I think, might be uh, to take a look at yourself and decide where your pain levels are. I, I've known people that uh, shouldn't be trading, and uh, it's because they can't take a single 1% down. I know other people whose pain levels are extremely high and can go to 50% down. If you can decide where you are going to be uncomfortable with it and then at that point say, I've had enough of this, I'm out of here, that will be your level. My own level is different from what I have to do for my clients. Since I'm trading client monies, my perception is, is that most clients have somewhere around a 20% pain level. 
So I try like crazy to keep the drawdowns less than 20. It's not to say you're always successful at doing that, but that's a good target area to start shooting for. I think most clients in the futures area nowadays are probably, especially institutional guys, and we have some people here that, uh, in, uh, for instance, uh, it's outselling institutions all the time. Uh, isn't it a fair statement probably that uh, 15 to 20 percent returns, if, if you could do them with any regularity and keep the drawdowns minimal, that'd be reasonably attractive. It's nowhere near the hundreds. In fact, the hundreds of percents, I think they'd throw David out the door, maybe. Uh, they'd be afraid. Of, so, they might anyway, right. He's been thrown out of quite a few doors. Okay. But um, that's, that's the answer. It's, it's up to you. No, in, well, in my own case, as long as I'm, a, as long as I'm, if I hit, so let's say I hit a drawdown limit where I say, you know, it's gone too far now. It's, this is unreasonably large for some reason. It's more than I would have expected. That's a time to take a look at what's going on. I guess really dig in and see if I've learned anything or there's something, something I've missed or something I'd like to, to add or whatever. Uh, as long as I'm in a drawdown and, and it's, it's an expected situation. In other words, if I'm a long-term position trader in the currencies, let's say, and the currencies are going sideways and I'm getting whipsawed to death, that's to be expected. I don't, and then it's not broken. Don't fix it. You know, it, it's what I would expect to be doing. I would be, you look and told me what the markets are doing and you ask, what do you expect you would be doing right now? I'd be saying I'd be losing money now. And then, then it's not broken, so don't fix it. So as long as it's normal, I think I don't fiddle with it. Let me continue with my very first episode with Tom Basso on this podcast. Tom, welcome. Thanks for stopping in today. Well, thanks for having me, Michael. I, uh, this is the first interview I've done, I think, in about eight years since I retired. You know, the great thing about the world of... Uh, uh, of trend trading is that I find that uh, that experience doesn't uh, there, there's no half life it doesn't it doesn't go away like there's a lot, there's a lot of wisdom that we can all pick up from folks that have been down the uh, the dusty trail so to speak uh, before I sometimes hear people tell me they're like well you know the big Coval what are you going to learn from these guys from from decades ago and I'm like uh, are you serious <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I hope, no, not uh, much changes Michael <laughs> it's uh, it's the same thing and uh, I was just looking. Uh, today to just make sure I knew where everything was since I haven't been interviewed in so long. Uh, I just I did a Google search on my name and Trendstat, my old firm's name, and I was amazed to find I gave up after 30 pages of results. It was amazing <laughs> all the stuff that once it's on the web, it just stays there forever. So uh, it's kind of a trip down memory lane. Yeah. Well, listen, let me let me jump in because I think a lot of people have gotten used to this and, and they like this. They they want to know, OK, I, I can pick up new market wizards and I can read this this great uh this great interview story that Jack Schwager put together with you many moons ago. But I think people, they, they really want to know, you know, what was what was Tom Basso like at 13 or 16? You know, what were you thinking about? Like, where did this, what were you doing early on? It, it, how did the migration happen, the switch? If you could maybe fill in some of that color, I think it'd be great. Well, I was 12 years old and <clears throat> I was delivering papers, the Syracuse Herald Journal on the evenings. And I had about 82 uh, subscribers and making about $10 a week. And I had a mutual fund salesman show up at my dad's house. I listened in and started buying mutual funds when I was 12 years old. 12? 12. 12. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a head start. Yeah. And uh, by the time I got to college, thanks to the loads, which I did not know anything about at that time, how much the salesman was taking out of the uh, front end. I had gotten back to break even on that position sometime just after I went to college at about 18 years old. And that's just break even. And I realized that the markets went up and down. And I started uh, in junior year of college worrying about where I was going to get a job as a chemical engineer, which is what I graduated from uh, Clarkson University up in Potsdam, New York. I had about 25 different job offers, so I thought one way to, to, to look at this might be to just sort of plot the stock of some of these companies and take a look at what they did. And uh, it ended up, I ended up going to work for Monsanto in St. Louis, and I uh, plotted Monsanto stock, and I ended up starting uh, to trade Monsanto stock 
uh, because it went up and down. And I realized that it'd be foolish to just buy and hold it because it seemed to pop up to 40 and go down to 20. And, you know, I might as well, you know, make money each time it does that because it didn't seem to get much above 40 those days back in the uh, 70s. That kind of led me more to trying to quantify how do I do this without having to think too much about it because I was a busy guy. I was getting an MBA. I was being a chemical engineer. At that time, I was starting up with the original firm that that was the precursor of Trendstat, which was Kennedy Capital, which still exists today in St. Louis, a small cap manager. Uh, I sold my share of Kennedy Capital and did Trendstat, but... uh, uh, you know, it was an evolution getting into futures and using trend following techniques on futures and getting into currencies because I ran out of futures capacity. And one thing leads to another. And pretty soon, 28 years have gone by and I'm retiring. OK, now, so I, I've had this problem before as guys like yourself, they make that whole story really fast, about 30, <laughs> about 30 seconds. OK, I'm not going to let you off the hook that quick. So, <laughs> okay. so at some point in time, there had I mean, you, you were starting to go down that path, but there had to have been a, a, a was beyond your own internal studies and looking at charts and observing this up and down nature of trends. Were you being inspired or influenced by anybody that came before you at the time? Hmm. I would have to say no, really. I was an engineer by background. I was very good with computers. And I really, you got to realize that I never was a broker. I never worked at an investment bank, never was on the floor of any exchange. I was really started out managing other people's money by way of an investment club. And a lot of the investment club people were kind of lazy and they left it to two of us to do most of the work. So I was one of those two guys. You know, being an engineer by background just gave me a real heavy uh, dosage of math and logic and problem solving and how to do things efficiently. And when you're flat running out of time and you realize that if I could, I I call it putting myself out of work, uh, I, I put all human endeavor into two sort of camps of endeavor, sort of, uh, the, the, production side of things where you're just grinding out something that you could teach a computer to do basically but for some reason you've decided to do it as a human being and the other side of human endeavor is more the creative side the one where you can't really teach a computer how to create something new or a piece of art or or whatever I realized that with a limited amount of time, if I was ever going to be creative and take trading to a new level and read new books and explore new uh, you know research angles that I had to get the actual trading function, the buying and selling, and where am I going to buy, and where am I going to sell, how much am I going to buy, how much am I going to sell. I had to get that to a point where it was so cookbook, I could get it done in you know very short amounts of time so that I'd have any time left to do anything creative. And so I basically set out when the, back in the days when the, remember if you remember the Radio Shack Trash 80, TRS 80, mm-hmm. was the first computer I got, and I went from there to the IBM PC and uh, bought an AT after that, and I just kept programming and programming, and my sole purpose was to just put myself out of work in terms of trading uh, every day, and evolved into a very, very automated trend stack capital that basically made no decisions by human beings uh, day after day. Uh, it was just basically a, a very, very automated uh, operation covering some 80 futures markets and what, 30 currency markets and about 20 mutual funds that we traded and uh, by I don't know how many different strategies or how many different dollars and it was it was very complicated but you, know, you just buy another computer and you just crank it. Well, let me so, let me let me bring you back even further a little bit. So you're 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 self taught. You are on the outside. You are not a part of mm-hmm. you know the trading floor up in New York City somewhere. You're not on the exchange floor. So talk to me about when it kind of hit you that okay, well, gosh, there's all these guys out there doing fundamentals. I'm a you know Warren Buffett's a value guy, and you've mm-hmm. made the decision that you're going to use price as a, is your is your core variable. And you're gonna you're gonna start to code this. So this this was all this the buying and selling of of prices of variable and figuring out how much to bet. That was something that you were trial and error figuring out on your own with without really any outside influences. Yeah, a little bit. Um, what the reason I I started looking at some of my early very very early stuff that I did, you know, like the mutual fund purchase with the low mutual fund manager guy, the salesman, and other 
purchases of actual stock after that. And I, you know, I looked a little bit at fundamentals and realized it was a quagmire of accounting information to get through. It took too much time. And I realized that no matter what I did, it seemed like there's always going to be somebody with a lot more time and stabs of people. And I had other engineers at Monsanto would we'd be sitting there and lunch and say, what makes you think you can do any better than some Wall Street firm with, you know, teams of analysts figuring all this stuff out? And I got to thinking about that and I started getting more global and sort of distant from it all and realizing that everything that all these people do ends up somehow, you know, in a what I thought of as a battle. I imagined going back to the, say, the Waterloo days, and you got Napoleon and Wellington up on the hills watching their armies down in the valley, maybe, uh, and, and you could watch the front line sort of going to the left and going to the right, and depending on who's winning at any one point in time. And I, I thought of that was my, my picture for what goes on in the marketplace. There's lots of people doing lots of different things, and some of them are buying and some of them are selling, and they all think they're right. They all think they, they know what they're doing, and they're doing it for a reason. But the sum total of all of that is where the price ends up, or in the case of the battle, where the front line is. So I thought, well, if I could just chart this, then I know where everybody out there that's participating wants to put this price. And if I just watch that and see that it's the battle is being won by one side over the other, like in other words, the buyers are beating the sellers this time around, then I might as well go lean that way because it looks like they are winning the battle. If the sellers are winning the battle, it'd be probably good to go that way. I didn't really think that much more about it than that. And uh, that kind of stilled my thinking into what I did for the rest of my life and still doing today. You know, we, we have a uh, we have a mutual friend who is uh, featured in my uh, book that came out last summer, The Little Book of Trading. Actually, two mutual friends featured in that book, uh, Eric Critton and, and Cole Wilcox. Oh, and, brilliant, guys. Brilliant. And I, I asked Cole the other day, I said, well, you know, I'm going to be talking to Tom. You know, what what would be a good question from your perspective? And he said that, that, <laughs> that, that, that <laughs> you're like, what's, oh, gosh, what's what's coming next? Uh, but he wanted you he wanted you to talk about lessons that you learned about life outside of trading where things didn't work. He, he said that, that, that he had really learned a lot from you about that, and I hope I'm not hitting mm. you blindsided. Mm, no, it's okay. Uh, you can ask me anything. The lessons that I learned of things that didn't work. Hmm. He must have something that, he, that stuck in his head that, that you had inspired him on. Well, you know, like, for instance, one thing that I was kind of... I don't know, I guess astonished at is back in the days when I had, just before I retired, I created this, oh gosh, it was like a Cadillac of something like six different programs that Trendset was running across all the markets that we traded, across all the computers we traded. This thing was so diversified, it was a multi-manager fund basically, however, run by one manager. So all the fees offset. I did all my fee calculations and incentive fees based on the aggregate total of it all. So for one hedge fund, you could get exposure to mutual fund timing of several different techniques. You'd get approach to currencies. You could get into uh, some options trading on agricultural commodities. You got about 80 different futures markets using some like three different techniques, long, short term, you know, medium term. And uh, all automated, all offset in a very reasonable um, uh, fee schedule. Far, far cheaper than a lot of the fee schedules that people were paying for. And I did 150 appointments. And of course, nobody's ever accused me of being the best salesman in the world. So we could always uh, you know, put that as a caveat out there. But uh, I did 150 appointments on Market Math, which was the, uh, the big flagship that we had. And I was the largest investor in market math and it was making some very nice money that's why i'm retired now <laughs> and i got zero dollars from my 150 appointments at which time i decided you know <laughs> I, I i'm tired of beating my head against the wall it doesn't seem like these people get it now years later people who are still in the industry like eric and uh, cole who i i think are brilliant guys actually uh they have told me that there's now more single manager multi-strategy funds out there now and that 
probably I was just a little bit too uh, ahead of my time on that one. But I just, you know, that's an example of something where as I read the industry and as you become part of an industry, if you, you're speaking to the the uh, professional money manager wannabes that are coming up and trying to figure something out. It seems to me you have to do an exceptionally good job of figuring out what it is your client wants first and then giving it to them. Uh, even if that sometimes isn't the best idea uh, over the very long run, but if you want to stay in business and really want to uh, raise a lot of assets so that you can fund those things that you really I uh, think are the important things that are the good, the good long-term decisions. You have to consider the fact that <clears throat> a good idea that nobody buys is is uh, not going to happen. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up that point because I, I had caught and, and doing a little homework on before we talked today, I had caught an, uh, an email exchange that you had with Ed Sakota a few years back. Mm. And uh, you were commenting on the fact that I guess somewhere on his – his questions and answers page, somebody made the comment that you don't like much heat. And I'm going to give you a, a second here to explain mm -hmm. to novices that term. Okay. But mm -hmm. And you respond, you say, well, hold on. It's not necessarily that, but I am giving clients what they can handle. Exactly. Uh, one of the biggest things that I found fault with a lot of money managers in my era in the early going, uh, and some of them are still out there. Some of them have already retired and some of them have blown up. Uh, is this concept that Ed calls heat. I just call it how much risk are you putting into the portfolio. And I think risk can be measured by a lot of different approaches. The ones that I used were specifically a percent of equity uh, of the risk to the stop loss. So take your risk from where you are to wherever the stop is. That's one form of risk as a percent of equity. The next one is volatility. How fast does a market move up or down each day? as a percent of, of your equity. The third picks up weird guys like Euro dollars or in the old days and um, some high margin, low volatility types of instruments that every now and again go crazy. And if you have too much of them in the portfolio, you're taking on too much risk. Markets are smart enough to add the margin in there. So I had margin as a percent of equity. And I would just do all three of those calculations and take the, the lower of the Whichever one came out the lowest in terms of number of contracts, that was how many I did. So I always erred to the conservative side, the least amount of contracts, the least amount of exposure. And by doing that, I think I kept my, you know, I, don't, I can't say that I lulled my clients to sleep, but I tried not to draw attention to myself in terms of clients looking at things every day and being overly caffeinated and calling me about every other hour uh, saying, do you see what gold did today or something? I think that was not going to serve the client well because the, they're basically going to always be excited when it's up and distraught when it's down. I was trying to level up my psychology of my clients and I was trying to uh, make sure that my own psychology was very level. I didn't want to get excited either. That's why Jack picked up on the Mr. Serenity thing, I guess. Uh, everything in Trendstat's life pretty, pretty much every day was uh, somewhat boring. You know, I still remember the first time I walked into Bill Dunn's office many moons ago when I had no clue about this industry, and I thought I was in a CPA's office, an attorney's office. I was like, where, where am I? Because I <laughs> literally weeks before that, I had been on Solomon, uh, Solomon Brothers trading floor at World Trade 7, and I was just like, well, uh, this is not making any sense. What's going on here? <laughs> so, mm -hmm, exactly. But, you know, you, you know, it's funny. You, you bring up this, uh, and I brought up that email that uh, you mentioned. But in that same email, you made an interesting comment, and you, you said that uh, – you, know, you talked about the desire to make sure clients could stand the heat. But you, you mentioned, and this was kind of a, I guess you were, you were announcing some retirement at that time, mm -hmm. but you said that you, you would approach your own portfolio different. Now, there, there's people listening to us today who perhaps don't want to be a trend-following trader for their own account, and perhaps they want to trade with, uh, put their money with uh, a trend-following trader. Mm -hmm. But for those that that hear me say that where you say, okay, I'm helping clients one way, but I'm willing to do something else for my portfolio, maybe you can explain that differential. Like why and I'm assuming you met you were willing to be you were willing to have a little more volatility and take more risk. I'm assuming. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, exactly right. In terms of my own personal portfolio, which has gotten larger over the years and, and spans quite a lot 
a lot of different markets and things. And because I understand exactly what I'm doing and I understand where my risks are, I can scenario analysis to death anything that I think might happen and feel like I can live with what I'm doing. Take as a good example my mother, who's 83, and less than 100,000 to her name in terms of, you know, um, you know, just retirement and uh, IRAs and stuff like that. She's going to sit there with zero knowledge. She almost is confused by what a CD at a bank is. That's the level of knowledge that she's got. So it's it's like kind of like the opposite spectrum. When I start talking about anything financial, her eyes glaze over. She has no idea what I'm saying. When you put yourself in the position of what would you do for a person like that and what could they feel comfortable with I think as a money manager, since you're being paid to manage other people's money, one of your first questions has to be, what are my clientele going to look like and how can I provide them something that I think that they will hire me for and keep me on the books for a long period of time? Otherwise, you're, I think a lot of CTAs in the past especially, is probably more so when I was coming up, uh, there was a lot of very, very high leverage guys and their household names uh, that have either come and gone or are still out there. And I'll, I won't spare you the, the, the list, but, you know, these guys could do 50% in a year and then they'd lose 20 and then they do 60 up and then another 27 down and, you know, they're all over the map. And their attitude is, I'm going to trade the way I think is best to trade to make the most amount of money over the long run. And if you want to come along for a ride with me, you're welcome to, Mr. Client. Hmm. I approached it the other way around. I said, I'm willing to change, you know, to sort of uh, harness myself down a little bit because my job is to be a money manager. I need to be thinking about what my clients are looking for, not what I might want to do myself because they're not prepared to do what I would do. In that harnessing down, though, too, I'm, I'm guessing that you saved yourself quite a bit of grief because while I'm not criticizing any of the guys that took the big risk and did the 50, sure. the 50 up and 25 down. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they heard from their clients a lot more in a, in a negative way, perhaps. Well, and they had money come in and out. They'd, you know, they'd raise $100 million and then they'd go down to $50 million and then they're up to $250 million and then down to $100 million. I got to believe they must be hiring people, firing people. It must be a, just a chaotic way to run a business. Let me let me jump into and we can talk a little. And I'm gonna come back to some of the uh, to the big picture trading principles that that you've developed over you know over your career. But mm-hmm. I wanted to jump into psychology, the psychology of trading, because I, I have a feeling uh, near and dear to you that that is where a lot of the success lies. And whether you're just a flat old entrepreneur or a trader or whatnot, the, the psychology of, of how you can make it through each day, I think sometimes maybe we all lose sight of such a basic sounding idea. Mm-hmm. I agree. And it's the most important thing, uh, I believe, in investing. It's way ahead of uh, the second most important thing, which would be risk control and volatility control and basically all your money management side, which is way ahead of the importance of what everybody concentrates on is doing simulation on buy-sell decision models. That's the least important thing to worry about. That's not changed, though, Tom. That's still, for the vast majority of folks out there, they still love that. <laughs> but basically, the, the reason's easy to see. I've done studies and I've been published and they've been other studies way beyond what I did where you take markets do random number generator to buy or sell, put a good stop loss behind it, do good money management with it, and you get a positive return on investment. So if you've, you're flipping a coin to buy and sell, how important can the buy and sell decision model be if you've put good money management behind it and you end up over time making a slight amount of money with a reasonable amount of risk? But, the, but even more so than that, think about the psychology. A lot of people used to think of Trendstad and Tom Basso as a sort of a, I don't know, robotic firm. You know, like we didn't think or we didn't do anything. But in reality, I'm the guy that has the name on the, you know, that, that, that owns the company. Any moment I want to, I can change any of those black boxes that we're running, right? So if I don't have good psychology, don't understand what I'm doing, understand, you know, 
what buttons of mine are tending to be pushed with certain types of market action and I stay the course and I know that this is normal or I know that something else is not normal and I need to do some work on that. I need to understand myself and the psychology that's being being uh, you know thrown into my face and my brain because if I don't, I'm lost. I just I could change the models every day if I wanted to, okay, just because well, of computers. So the psychology is the most important thing of all because that will drive what everybody does. It'll allow it, it, it forces them to abandon systems that are basically sound systems just because it's on a slight drawdown. They start tweaking things. They overcomplicate things, or they overly simplify things, or they they get on a, a run and get full of themselves and start leveraging too much and then they blow up. There's lots of different ways it can hit you, but understanding yourself is the most important thing of all. Let me, let's break that down some, because I think sometimes people want to get down down to brass tacks. So when you say understand yourself, so tell me about Tom getting upset or Tom not getting upset. Did you go through your whole trading career on kind of an even keel where they're were there ups and downs emotionally? How did you talk to me? Some examples. Some well, I- Schwager, Schwager documented this one. It's a well-known example of a situation where there was two different situations, and they both involved silver, strangely. I don't know how that happened, but uh, I was trading silver. This is back probably, I'm in the business maybe four or five years. And my mom and dad were going to come and visit me down in St. Louis, which is where we were at that time. So I had this dutiful son take off the, the one week and uh, you know play tour guide and you know was working as a chemical engineer and running them around. Didn't have time to update my stuff. Missed a silver trade that broke out, but being the good disciplined trader that I am, decided no nope, breakout already happened. Not going to jump in late. You know when I updated all my stuff after my mom and dad had left, and I just missed it, and that turned out to be the most profitable trade of any market during the entire year. So it was very frustrating watching it and I realized that I needed to make sure that that didn't happen again because I didn't want to be frustrated like that. So what I did was I told myself if I'm going to create a strategy, I have to be able to run it every single day, day after day, and I'm not missing anything. And I haven't missed a a trade after that for years and years and years and years. Because I put things in place and I put backups in place and I make sure things are, you know, on stops and whatever I have to do to make sure if I'm going to be, say, talking to you and markets will be open or something, or if I'm taking a vacation, I'm going to Italy this summer, I'll be there three weeks. Well, hey, you know, I'm going to have everything taken care of. I'll be trading right through it and it won't even bother me and I'll still be on vacation. So when you use the word frustration, so I think for a lot of people, maybe if they're in that situation, instead of turning around and saying, oh, let's automate the approach. I mean, it sounds like you you weren't emotionally upset. It was more of a problem to solve. Is that exactly. how you, okay? It was like an engineer's problem to solve. We got this, you know, a chemical engineer. So think of it as a chemical factory. You got stuff coming in one side, you process it, goes out the other side. And uh, a lot of trading I thought of as chemical engineering too. You got information coming in over satellite, you know, com links and, internet lines and everything else, you process it either manually with your eyes and your brain or by computer with databases and and programming language like we did at Trendstat, and out comes orders that are shipped off to exchanges and brokers and FCMs and wherever they're going. So it's sort of like that little chemical factory. Trendstat to me was my little chemical factory. There was stuff coming in, processing, stuff going out. And when I look at, uh, in the early days, my trading, I thought of it the same way. I've got a lot of information. I've got to get it done every day. I don't have a whole lot of time to do it, so let's make it as quickly and, and automated as possible. And then I go on and ship orders and go on the rest of my life. So that was what I thought of it as problem solving. But the other example involving uh, silver is probably a little closer to an emotional reaction, I would say. This was a silver trade. My account had gotten up to, I think, about... This was in the early years of trading. I think I was up to like, uh, I want to say fifty to a hundred thousand. I can't remember the exact number. I hit the same silver upswing that the hunts were trying to corner. If you remember back to those days, mm-hmm. due to silver solely, and you know, I'm here. I'm the trend follower. I'm going to stick with this, and I've got so many contracts. And man, let your profits run, cut your losses short. 
And silver's starting to, <clears throat> to go limit up and down all over the place. And the hunt stuff comes out and it collapses back. And I've got my stops in. I'm fine. But I saw my account go from like 100000 up to 500000 in just a month or six weeks or something insane. And I saw it in the next two weeks go down to 250000 I ended up making, I don't know, $150,000 on the one trade. And at that level, it was probably 150% return on my portfolio. This is way before I understood uh, what I understand now. But out of that... I can tell you, without a doubt, I was watching silver every day. I almost didn't care about the rest of my portfolio. It was very emotional attachment up and down and all over the place. And I said, wait a second. You, you caught silver. yourself with that emotional yeah. attachment. It, it, it caught myself with the emotional attachment. I always have had this sort of tendency in my brain to be able to sit back at the end of the day and observe how I interacted with the day. And it's a very useful thing to have sort of an observer self that can – sort of be impartial if you want to think of them that way and, and to sit back and it sounds like a split personality but I'm not meaning to make it sound crazy you just want to be introspective and you want to be non-judgmental and you just want to sit there and say you know how did you do today did you were you even killed did you do all the things you were supposed to do today did you get mad at somebody did you were you overly uh, uh, excited to the point of missing something uh, did you get emotional here what you know just kind of do a little bit of a, a counting summary of how the day go. You know, when I looked at the silver thing, I decided, you know, I was right in being a good trend follower and putting my stops in and letting the profits run and cutting the losses short. But there was no reason why I had to let my emotions go up and down and all over the place if I just controlled the size of my position. And that led to me to my very first uh, risk control scheme, which was to say that as the stops got farther and farther away, in the case of silver, my risk got humongous. There was no reason to have well, however many, I can't remember how many I had. Let's say I had five or ten or positions. Maybe I needed six. Maybe I needed four. Maybe I only needed one contract. During the uh, Gulf War breaking out at Trendstad, I think we had maybe one or two clients that ended up with one crude oil contact, contract on after the volatility went from 32 overnight to 40 and back down and opened up the next day at 22 or something. That was insane volatility and it just completely kicked all of the positions out of everybody's portfolio because nobody had enough equity to afford even one contract. So we took care of the problem easily and it was no big deal. Um, I think that a lot of people get caught up in the emotion of the thing and then they just think well that's what trading's all about you know they're i mean jack schwager uh, even admitted to me that he loves caffeine and coffee and when he was interviewing me i think one of the reasons he thought of me as mr serenity is he's just exactly the opposite he's overly caffeinated and extremely hard working and very quick and you know stay up all night and finish the chapter on the book and all that and they're really that's not very healthy over the long run i don't think and it i don't think it helps your trading uh, because you're sitting there trying to cloud your judgment with all these you know chemical imbalances in your body from all the emotions that are driving you and you know from frustrated to depression to excitement to euphoria to you know everything else that can happen in trading and, and the markets love to push your buttons so if you can sit back and figure out how your buttons got pushed and figure out a way to round that i think you're well served in trading to do that let me i got an angle here for you so are you a golf fan you golf no, i okay. just uh, just came back from the range actually okay, okay so so i'm not a huge golf fan but i i followed it enough and uh, you know I, I i caught the end of the masters okay mm -hmm. and uh, obviously this 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 and some of my family's from the south so this great southern character bubba watson you mm -hmm. know hits the shot you know, mm -hmm. basically lays it all out there, wins the Masters. I take nothing away from him because some of our legendary sports feats are are one shot, and that's and you go down in the Hall of Fame with that. But you, here you are, you're you're talking about your process. And Tom is focused on process, process, process. You're not sitting around necessarily thinking about the outcome. You're you're focused on your process. You're grinding it out. So I look at Bubba's shot, and I think to myself. Some of the guys that did exceptionally well in the real estate crisis, 
John Paulson, Michael Burry, guys mm-hmm. that are exceptionally smart, made great trades. But maybe you can talk to the person that's listening out there and explain the idea of laying it all on the line in the in the world of money to try and hit one home run versus grinding out a career and maybe lay out the pros and cons to people well okay the uh the, making one shot and i think a lot of people have indicated that buffett sort of falls into this rule and that he has made the lion's share of his profits off of a select few uh, very big home runs that he said over his entire career, but he's had plenty of losers along the way too, and and that kind of gets glossed over a lot. And the net result of it all is the winners, of course, have uh, more than paid for the losers, as we find in most trend following cases. You know that's fine. Uh, it, he has a big image uh, that way. Uh, it, but examine the the trend stats of the world that are just grinding it out and trying to. You know, keep their clients happy and not do anything too flashy and and all that. And uh, you know, I think I would summarize my uh, my image in the industry back in the day probably as boring. I think a lot of people uh, probably would not have gotten too awfully excited. I mean, Jack Schwager wasn't even going to interview me. Until- because, oh, hold on. it was never boring to you, though, was it? Well, it was never boring to me. Okay. I, I was doing, uh, you know, I was running a nice business. I thought we had a good clientele. I thought we had a good crew of uh, staff at Trendstat. Uh, I enjoyed running the business when I did run it. I'm enjoying retirement now that I'm not running it. Uh, I, I probably would enjoy life every day, no matter what I was <laughs> doing, probably. But I think that the lesson to be learned here is if you want to hit the home run and all that, uh, that's fine. But uh, let's not consider that Bubba Watson was not running his process. He uh, he likes to move the ball. He was out at my club just uh, a few weeks ago, ended up shooting 67 there from the back tees and made it look easy. Went and shot 58 the next day up at Estancia, which is a pretty difficult desert course. He likes to move the ball, so he can take a shot. He's a lefty, that shot was well in his wheelhouse. He can imagine it. He can hit a wedge, turn it down, and he's going to make that ball go left or right a whole lot more than most people probably could humanly do that. But that's his normal way of playing. So that wasn't out of his uh, comfort level or anything. Uh, I, that's a that's a really good analogy. You just made me have the light bulb moment because if you, if you say, I remember there's a, a trader that I – interviewed for a book last summer named Paul Mulvaney and Paul had his system his trend following system and when he came into the fall of 2008 he had no earthly idea that October of 08 would produce him 40% in the month however he was following his process so I think that's the exact point you're making isn't it no the same same thing true of our currency programs in 97 when the Japanese uh, yen was I think we were getting down to uh, the yen dollar was down to I think it hit eighty or something. It turned around, I forget whether it came down from one fifty or or then turned around and went back to one forty or something. It was like huge swing one way, huge swing the other way, and I'm sitting in this thing with all of our programs for I mean my trade. I'm just rolling it every month, rolling it, rolling it, rolling it, rolling it, rolling it. I'm in the same trade for like a year and a half. I mean, people think of trading as, okay, you buy today and you sell next week. This was buying and selling over a whole year and a half in commodities, for crying out loud, or currencies. But that made me so much money. It's made the client so much money and the incentive fees off of that and everything else. I mean, um, that that was probably the record year that I was in the business in terms of uh, the amount of money that Trendstat made. And I had no clue that that was going to happen. I have not... I'm sort of a, an amateur economist in terms of I understand a lot about economics, and you watch some of my Facebook posts, and you know which way I lean on a lot of things. You um, have no opinions, Tom. Yeah, no, I have opinions. <laughs> I have a few. I, I'm more libertarian by uh, you know by uh, you know philosophy and all that, but I I like to examine economics from the standpoint of how the behavior of the people involved with the decision. If you look at it from that standpoint, you usually can figure out which way economics will go on almost anything that you would propose. And it just seems like so much of what goes on today doesn't do that. And it's and then there's this big surprise when it doesn't work. I don't know, what? you got to be kidding me. It's not that hard. But well, uh, 
I keep making the case to folks. I say, well, listen, if you if you believe that we're in this this world of chaos and I, I, I can't know what's going to happen in the future, maybe it'll just become this nice, serene environment. But if we are in this world of chaos, what can one do to participate in chaos to or maybe it's not the right word to, to actually excel? But let, let me I'm going to jump into something for for those folks out there that, that are maybe uh, further along and they want to hear something more interesting. I'm holding in my hands here. Oh, by the way, just before I even say this, I think we met before. Oh, I think we, it, 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 you'll have to correct my memory. 1996 in Berlin Managed Futures Association Conference. Were you there? Yes, I was. Then that's where we met because we sat next to each other. But, anyways, that's neither here nor there. I because I was thinking I I was, so many people. I'm afraid, Michael. <laughs> I'm sure I would have remembered you, but uh, I apologize for no, that. No, no. I was just trying to make sure I wasn't completely losing my marbles. So I'm holding in my hands a document that I have uh, done my level-headed best to, and I hope hopefully you won't uh, you won't have counsel call me up and go Covell get rid of that <laughs> um, <laughs> I've I've been disseminating this off my websites for eons when to allocate to a CTA buy them on sale yes Tom Basso um, from a from a few years ago however it's amazing how many times today to still to this day mm-hmm. I will talk to traders that are either running their own accounts or uh, trading a fund and they have this mentality. And I've got a buddy who runs a small fund who literally, there must be some systematic index of trend followers that he actually will look at just for kind of extra guidance, not part of his system, where he kind of thinks that it, it, it kind of, it actually correlates sometimes when his fund starts to gear up on positions. But anyways, why do I let you kind of just, your professor, you know, Professor <laughs> Tom, and I've got this white paper here in front of me. How would you generally explain this idea to people that are either new or experienced? The idea of buying a trader uh, on sale. Okay, well, if you figure out about what drives trend following, trend following is driven by the fact that there's asymmetrical returns. There's 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 big long runs like the Japanese yen trade that I just talked about. Whereby sometimes when I total up all of the trend set trades over an entire year, maybe two or three of the trades paid for all the profits. If you could isolate them up, pick them up and say, okay, I could just get these three trades. That was the difference between zero and whatever it is we made that year. All the rest of the trades maybe even netted out to zero. There were some some years where it was that close. So if you make the assumption that there's going to be periods of time where the market goes sideways, which the stock market's a good example right now, it seems to me like the last, I don't know, three weeks or so, it's gone nowhere. It's basically in a range and it's bouncing around and every day it seems like if it's going down one day, it goes up the next day and down again and up again. And During that type of an environment, trend followers are not going to make money because there's no trend to follow. Typically, if you're depending on where your time frames are, unless you're trading each one of those little swings and doing some short-term trend following, there isn't a trend long enough for the kind of once-a-day guy to, to really catch much. On the other hand, there's going to be periods like back in 97 when the, uh, the Japanese yen goes crazy or maybe in the future when the dollar goes down a lot or something like that, whatever. Those types of trades more than pay up for all the the losses during the sideways periods. If you then make the assumption that there's always an end to a sideways period, and there's always an end to the profitable period, then it would make sense to look at a trend follower who's trading lots of markets, lots of noise creating drawdowns, lots of trending markets creating profitable periods, to actually sort of, if you want, trade the, uh, the traders. Rebalance yourself when you when one trader makes too much money and is getting really really uh, you know leveraged and going crazy, you know maybe you back off some money there and you spread it amongst other traders that are acting a little more conservative and might be able to hold on to those profits during the next static sideways period where everybody is going to tend to lose money. And vice versa, when you get a, a, somebody in a a deep drawdown, unless He's changed something, or you've lost complete, um, you know, uh, what trust in what he's doing. Then t- 
tap, you know, balance right back into the guy that's on the biggest drawdown because you're going to, he's coming up on the next period, which will be his biggest profitable period again. It seems like the industry does exactly the opposite of that. I did another white paper called uh, Performance Gap, which was difference between CTA returns and client returns. And I did the top, uh, it turns out everybody over 75 million and up that had a five-year track record in the MAR database back in the old days, which doesn't even exist today. I think it's Barclays these days. And out of the 27 CTAs that met that criteria, 27 out of 27 times, and boy, is that telling, the time-weighted return that the CTA was actually providing by trading was greater than the dollar way to return that the clients actually got by all their chasing the hot track record, pulling it out at the bottom, and all the nonsense that clients went through. It's very frustrating and very sad. It, it, it saddened me to see basically my clientele out there doing stuff that hurt themselves from making a good return. And I wrote about it, and it didn't seem to do any <laughs> good to anybody. I don't know. Well, so, don't so, know Tom, psychologically, I, why would you say the investors don't invest on drawdowns? I think psychologically because they don't really understand trading. Uh, they can't deal with their own psychology, and they don't realize how important psychology is. So what ends up happening is when they see it down, they kind of in the mind, you, you start extrapolating that dotted line down, you know, down, 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 down. It's going to be X months before I'm you know, totally gone or something. And likewise, I think uh, psychology on the upside is, you know, this guy's got a great track record for five years and it keeps going up and up and up and never goes down. And so let's draw that dotted line up to off the top of the chart. And uh, which one would I rather have? I'd rather, you know, in my mind, have that guy that's going off the top of the chart rather than the one that's going to lose me all my money. I think that's the, they don't, they don't step back from themselves and realize the trap they're putting themselves in. And they don't understand even why trend followers have made money over the long run. I'm sure you get tons of criticisms and hocus pocus and all the, I see some of the Facebook comments and, uh, you know, you, it's really easy to sit there and, and, and plot monthly volatility of, say, a market, which I've done. In Trendstat's case, I uh, took, uh, I don't know how many different markets we did it on, but months where there was large volatility were the months that were profitable by trend-following strategies. Months with small volatility were months where the systems basically lost money. So large volatility, profit, low volatility, and, and low direction, uh, you know, losses. And it, so it's as simple as, if you looked at a whole year of monthly returns and monthly types of uh, indexes, indices in the uh, various markets being traded, you should be almost able to predict what should have been the average CTA's returns for February because these following things occurred, it was probably a losing month. Or these things occurred, it was probably a winning month. It was a big winning month or a small winning month. You could actually just judgmental yourself right into it if you had the data and you understood where trend following returns came from. But all these fancy people with all their doctorates and all their computers and staff don't seem to be able to figure that out. And so here I was in Trendstat's case, you know, buying my own programs when they were in a drawdown. And meanwhile, my clients are calling up and firing me. And then people would be throwing money into my hedge funds when I was making new highs and I'm taking some money off the table and giving it away to other managers or doing other things with it, you know, trying to, you know, uh, salt it away to take some off the table and even out my portfolio a bit. And so I found myself doing exactly the opposite of what my clients were doing all the time. And I'm trying to convince them to do what I'm suggesting they do, but they would not hear anything of it. That was, that was, that was the question I was going to lead to is that some folks are just, it's, they're never going to change. It's not going to, yeah. it's, it's not going to happen. And it's one of the several reasons why I just decided, you know, to call it a day and uh, move on to golf and fishing and cooking and dancing and singing and uh, singing. Hold on, so are you going to are you going to sing for us? I, I was I was on stage with Ed Sakota doing his banjo last. Uh, I think it was a year and a half ago. So are uh, you, you're going to sing for us? What are you singing for us today? Or you're not going to sing? Oh, I could. Okay. What, what, what kind of what kind of singing? Well, I like fly me to the moon. <laughs> And let me live amongst those stars. There we go. I've, I've got a first. I've actually made news today, right? Yeah. 
Here, let me, let me, let me, I know we only got a few more minutes here. I know I told you I wouldn't keep you past an hour, but, uh, um, I'm, I'm good as long as you want to go. Okay. Well then we'll keep playing here. Um, I've, I, I've got a, a lot of different experiences over the years with talking to different folks and, and I know you'll probably have some other thoughts on this, but sometimes when I talk to, to folks that have been in your position, um, running a successful fund for a long time, nice track record, uh, they say things that most people, I think, from the, the outside looking in, they don't expect to hear. I'll let you comment on this. So two examples in the last couple of years that hit me. I, I had a chance to speak with uh, uh, David Harding over in London several times, and he starts talking about you know, looking to be a cockroach and, and looking to be like Madonna. And, and, and then Salem Abraham is talking about how to avoid a meteor strike. Okay, and, and clearly they're they're talking about surviving, like, and yeah, so exactly. they're worried about surviving. And yeah. talk talk to that notion where you know, because every the, the average person sees the headlines and oh, these guys made all this money and they're da da da. But the reality is to, to to have the chance to make it, you've got to be there still. Exactly, and that, and one of the things that I <clears throat> I think is the only reason probably why you're talking to me right now might be, or one of the reasons that you're you're able to be talking to me, let's say is that I was able to, by controlling risk, controlling volatility, avoiding the meteor strike that Salem would talk about, or David's uh, cockroach thing, uh, both are interesting analogies. You're, I looked at it as, I, must, I have to play today's game so that I can play the game tomorrow. If I'm out of the game tomorrow, I've done nobody any, I've, I've done no good for anybody. Uh, I, you've got to be able to keep playing the game because statistics, it's like the casino. The, if you're trying to get the statistics on your side, and I think trend following does that well, it does it even better if you use very, very good money management models. Control your risk, control your volatility, control your margin, control the types of markets you select to trade and by which strategies and all those things. That's where a lot of the work is very fruitful. And I think once you have something that you feel comfortable works and you understand how it works intimately. I mean, down into your soul, you know exactly what type of market is going to feed your profits and what type of market you're going to be licking your wounds. But you're able to keep coming back and playing that game tomorrow. As long as you can do that, then the statistics are going to end up working out in your favor over the long run. And you're a survivor. And you can have a 28 or 30 year run in the industry like I did. And be around long enough so that people actually recognize your name because you've been at so many MFA conferences or MRA conferences and shaken so many people's hands and and had people interview you and you know been quoted in the Wall Street Journal or whatever and you know it's just because you survived. It wasn't necessarily because you were flashy. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna jump around a couple. Of, so you, you you talked about this already. You mentioned that the kind of uh, if you can look at the market the markets movement and you consider low volatility and high volatility, you can almost start to figure out where the CTA universe might be making their money. Mm -hmm. But talk to me and and maybe talk to folks out there. The idea that I I regularly see this where where, where people really truly imagine they're going to make money every month. Somehow or another, they're going to make money every month, and, and I've, and I'm sure there's probably somebody out there, maybe because their server is right next to the exchange server or something, <laughs> and they've got some, they, you know, they're trading on light speed, something that I don't even understand. <laughs> exactly. uh, but uh, I've I've said recently that whenever I see a track record, and, and part of my background was looking at all these track records, like, well, this is so great. Look at all the before I knew anything about trend following. I was like, look at all these CTA track records. This is such a wealth of information. But as, I, as, I've, as time has moved on, I've realized that if, if a track record exists that shows me making 1% to 2% every month with, ever, with never a down mm-hmm. month, I say to myself, I've either got long-term capital management on my hands, a, <laughs> a strategy that's going to blow up, or Bernard Madoff on my hands. Yeah, uh, I would agree with that. Uh, or a third uh, solution to that, Eric Crittenden would say, uh, you've got a short volatility manager probably. And short volatility would mean it'd be something like selling naked options, for instance. If you sell them far enough out and you sell them far enough away from the money, the vast majority of the time, the option expires worthless, you make that money. So you can produce profits this month and next month and next month and next month and next month. And then you have the long-term capital where uh, somebody's leveraged uh, a whole lot 
and that short volatility comes to roost with a very large movement in the markets and the volatility blows up and they're short the volatility so it just kills them and with the leverage and everything else three years of profits month monthly profits uh, in a row just go down the drain and they blow up and they're gone and so yeah i i'm very suspicious of uh track records that are if they're professing to be trend followers and doing it month after month with profits, my hat would be off to them. I don't, uh, you got to be, uh, you got to be really figuring that one out because it's a, uh, it's a tough nut to crack. So let me let me go at Professor Tom again. So I'm showing up at your class and it's okay. financial psychology 101. I'm 18 years old. I really don't know much about anything. Now I, I, I'm, and I'm I'm forcing you to. To, to, to go back in time to how you would communicate to that audience because mm -hmm. in many ways that audience is is the, the general audience out there so what are you saying on the first day of class when you start the presentation how are you in getting people to come to the point where they're ultimately going to build to hopefully to have your foundation and your your background and your knowledge but what do they have to know in that first week what are some of the basics that we we really want people to get mm. First first day, they don't know anything, Tom. Yeah, I know. It's uh, <laughs> it's difficult. Before you even can even deal with things, simple things like uh, what would a moving average do or uh, what a trend-following model might be or how to control risk or volatility, you'd have to actually know how to put in a you know a, a stock trade. My mom, for instance, the 83-year-old retiree, would not even know what a stockbroker was, wouldn't have one, doesn't know how to even articulate an order. So she would have a hard time even doing the basic first trade. Uh, so you'd have to teach people uh, something basic about the market, how to put a trade in, and the fact that the market is a place where buyers and sellers come together, basically. And once you got past the nuances of whether it's futures markets and you're dealing with ticks and currency markets, you're dealing with pips and and so on and so forth. And you got through that maybe in the first day, you could then get on to uh, the issues or, or the, I, I think the three pillars of success for trading. And one of them is going to be uh, understanding what it is that you're trying to do. And what I mean by that is you're going to have to, each person's going to have to come to some conclusion of why the markets do what they do. It, there may be those that think economics drives it because they're economics majors and that's what they want to base everything of, of their decision on. And you're going to have to come to that conclusion and then you're going to have to build risk and volatility and portfolio selection around what your comfort level is and then you're going to have to work on a buy and sell decision model and once you have those three things together you have a shot at being successful even if you're an economist uh, wouldn't be my cup of tea but you know I'm sure there's economists out there they're doing just fine uh, if they can get everything together but that that's the way I would approach it is try to teach, teach those th three things, the understanding of what you want to do and what makes the markets work from your viewpoint, not from Michael Koval's uh, uh, viewpoint or Tom Basso's. It, it's basically what drives the individual doing the trade because it's you who has to decide to stick with the system or abandon it or add new markets or tweak the strategy or all the things that go on. And if you're not comfortable with that, it ain't going to happen. But you also have to have control of what markets you trade. Some are going to make sense to you, some are not. You're also going to have to have a decision model that could be something like a breakout on a chart or a moving average going over or whatever it is. You're going to have to have something to trigger your action. And I think those three things, you get those together, you've probably got a, a shot at uh, at least getting into the game. Well, you know, since since it is uh, 2012, and as far as I know with technology and interviews and stuff, I don't know what the rules are. I, I have no training in anything. Um, I have to ask you what, what are you what are you thinking about these days? What you know, this doesn't necessarily have to just be an interview. I want to know what what is Tom thinking about these? Days? Besides the fun part, the singing, the golf, the dancing, <laughs> I know your brain is still thinking about stuff. So, what are some of the things that that you might want to leave people with today? That the kind of the the, the big picture. Uh, maybe it could be a life parable, anything you might want to say that's just near and dear to you right now. I would say the thing that I think about the most, and I've noticed several post, uh, Facebook posts uh, by some of the friends that you have and so, some of the friends that I have these days, and we have some of the same friends. And, I, and I'm seeing this 
over and over again. And there's a lot of us out here in the trading world. And hell, you know, you got to figure I've, I've traded 80 commodity markets. I've traded 30 currency markets. I've traded all sorts of ETFs and mutual funds. I used to trade stocks. I used to trade options. I used to trade treasury bonds even. And I sit here in today's environment. We're running up another $5 trillion in debt. We're debasing the dollar with all the QE, one, two, whatever, quantitative easing. I'm sitting here trying to figure out each day, how am I supposed to financially survive in retirement uh, and protect and grow my assets? And I'm a guy that has traded almost everything that is tradable. Uh, and I feel really sorry for like the people like my mother, who has confused by a CD, because I am having a hard time coming up with ways, you know, aside from doing my basic trend following stuff and trying to go with the trends that we all do, and in some months having a better month than other months, but you get this feeling like the trend followers of the world are going to nail it and things are going to go collapsing or go skyrocketing inflation or whatever happens. The trend followers are absolutely going to nail it. But you're going to win the race, and then you're going to look around and say, yeah, but... Yeah, post, the, post-apocalyptic. The, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I sit there and I think, okay, let's see. If you're a, a successful trader and you're part of the 1% and you're looking at what it is that you're supposed to be doing to position your portfolio, and if you're in the client business, your client's portfolio, so that they can preserve their purchasing power over the long run, what, what I call net wealth instead of net worth you got to increase your net worth to keep your net wealth the same in an, in an era where the dollar is getting debased it's very difficult to see how to do that tom you and you're but you're not saying that also i mean you've 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 got a few decades of experience here you've mm-hmm. seen many different climates many different markets many different socioeconomic political patterns mm-hmm. and are, are you expressing a feeling about 2012 and going forward that's much different than you felt in your lifetime? I feel like we're setting up for the potential for some very large moves, which trend followers are going to love. So it's, it's feeds your your game that you're you're. Now, uh, but, I'll, but hold on, you, let's let's just clarify here, so people don't. I don't immediately get the emails. Tom Tom's making predictions. No, no you're, I'm not <laughs> making predictions at all. I just have the sense that we're straining the financial structure of the country to the point where now debt is over. You know, is, is more than 100. percent I think it's like 108 percent GDP. That's getting to be pretty, you know, unusual and rarefied air. In other words, if you look at the economic statistics of the United States and even the rest of the world. We're pushing levels to levels that have not been seen before. When you get that type of stuff, you have the potential for collapses. You have the potential for bubbles and the bubbles bursting possibly. You see, you have some very, very high volatility potential. I have no prediction about which way anything is going to go. I think, I hope, that trend following would probably be there to uh, capitalize on a lot of those major moves. However, at the same time I'm capitalizing it, I'm concerned that the value of what you have when you're all done with it, while greater net worth than you have today, might not be worth as much Mm. to go out and buy anything with it as it does today. Right. You You feel like in a retirement situation, my grandfather lived to 98, I'm 59 now. Uh, So, you know, I'm in great health, I'm enjoying life, but if I were to live to my grandfather's age, 98, I've still got uh, 39 years to go. That's longer than I was in the business. It's pretty pretty interesting to think in those terms, decades, I've got to manage my portfolio and figure out how to, you know, at least keep my net wealth roughly the same so I can continue to enjoy a nice retirement. Well, it's... Uh, that's the one thing that crosses my mind more and more lately, and I, I, it's it's a tough puzzle to think about because the solution sort of is out there, you know, in the hands of like the entire country, not just me. I can't control what happens around me. I, you know, I've even looked at. Geez, I traveled all over the world. I've looked at, thought about it. You know, what would I, if I move to Australia? How would that be? And or Switzerland or Britain or you know. I've been to all those places, and they're all you know fine in their own ways, nice places to visit, but I call the USA home. 
and I like Phoenix, Arizona. I think it's a great place to live. You'd have to be hard pressed to get me out of here. But given that I've made that decision to stay here, and I've got to, then the, the state of Arizona and the, and the country of the United States around me, I have to live with you know I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of pages of tax code to deal with my taxes, and I have to deal with you know all the different economic decisions that are made that I'm pulling on my hair over and saying, yeah, you got to be kidding me. That's a stupid thing to do. And uh, But if we keep making those stupid decisions, I feel like I'm going to be in the middle of this chaotic n- nonsense trying to survive along with everybody else, admittedly with maybe more knowledge about what I might be able to do. But right at the moment, it's really hard for me to figure out an easy answer mm. to be able to articulate to someone and say, you know, I think we should do the following, one, two, three, four, five, and that'll probably set you up to be able to survive fine. I, I don't think it's just as easy as going out and buying gold coins, for instance, which you see the ads all the time on the television. Or, um, You know, gold is fine. It might go up, might go down. People may, you know, take your coin in terms of buying something or they may not want your coin. There's a lot of uh, unknown out there, and I think I, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, I think the economy was a little bit sort of going sideways. It wasn't really robustly growing. After Reaganomics kicked in, it kind of got good for a while. But then through Clinton years, we, you know, we sort of did all right. Bush year was okay. And, you know, but I think we've strained the system so much now. I kind of wonder whether uh, there isn't some really big moves coming up and uh, so I would encourage everybody to be a trend follower here but uh, good luck figuring out how to deal with it I mean for instance the MF Global raised another issue what if yeah, you're right <laughs> what if you're right and we had this issue in currency trading all the time what if the Japanese yen goes to US dollar goes to 10 cents or something or, or 10 and you just slay the heck out of it, but the place that you're doing your counterparty, you know, your counterparty risk and all that, can't pay you your profits because they're bankrupt. Right. So you've won the <laughs> you've won the battle, but there's no victory. I think I think that's the and, and I'm I'm going to say the unspoken. I know it's spoken by some people for sure, but it seems like it's the unspoken feeling that that a lot of people that are that are awake. Are having right now which is like even mm-hmm. if i have a good process even if i have worked a little bit harder than maybe the folks that are just playing uh nintendo or xbox all day long that i still might end up in the same place that they are yeah just about yeah you might be just slightly ahead of them but uh, you know <laughs> you still having a, a lot worse time of uh of making your way through your day than you would be uh, normally, you know, I think it, there's the potential for us all to be dragged. It's kind of like dragging down the one percent to be to the ninety nine, rather than trying to think of raising the ninety nine up uh, and, and getting rid of the restrictions to allow the ninety nine percent to to do better. I think we we're approaching it the wrong way in a political sense, but we're also in the process straining the economy and a lot of the different aspects of the markets to where I have no, you know, I, I have to hope that. You know, my commodity accounts, let's say, that are custodied at, at a certain FCM, let's say, is the, what if the FCM goes bankrupt? All right? You know, because they've done something that I can't control. I end up making a bunch of money on a big move. They're somehow short that same move or whatever, and, uh, you know, they lose their shirt and they can't pay me my profits because their capital's gone. And I'm like, wow, uh, that's. That's getting pretty uh, out there in your thinking, but I didn't used to think of those types of things as much back in the 70s and 80s, but it seems like we're setting ourselves up for some of those types of scenarios to come to pass, which is worrisome. Let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more thing, though, so, we, so I can leave you on a, a, a nice, <laughs> inspirational, because mo- I, look, I, we all feel that those things, we, we know there's something wrong. That's the bottom line. We all know there's something wrong. There was a great article in the New York Times the other day about uh, people and, their, and their, their phones, and, and everyone doesn't even, they don't even talk anymore. They just, they, you see, everyone's walking around and, and their thumbs are, uh, the, genetic, uh, the genetic fingerprint of the thumb is changing from doing these little devices, and no one talks. They're all looking down. It's a very weird society right now. 
Besides the point, let me ask this question about entrepreneurship, because clearly you've been a successful entrepreneur. And I, I relate to anybody that goes out there and says, man, uh, you, know, you know, everybody works for the man in, in some capacity at some point, but you, you broke away. Mm-hmm. You, you became an entrepreneur. So how is being an entrepreneur, do you ever think about how different that makes you the, the, yeah. in terms of your thinking, your feeling? Oh, I I do all the time. I guess not so much now, except to just observe people who aren't. Uh, There's so many of them. There's, uh, I always had the attitude of a sort of, I don't know where I got this from. Somewhere along the way, I I think it almost was back in the years when I was doing some things with Van Tharp, Van K. Tharp uh, has some programs for traders on the psychology of things. And I, did some speaking with him for uh, some times. And somewhere along the way, I decided that the easiest way for me to deal with my entire life and the universe around me was to take responsibility personally for everything that happened in my life. Everything. Even if it was caused by somebody else, to figure out how I could warp my judgment to the point where I could be responsible for that. And if you are responsible for everything and then you jump to the next line of thinking that you can then take some control of it uh, and change decisions or change your path or do something different you can move your whole life far afield I I started out as a chemical engineer and I ended up as a currency trader by the time I retired the immediate question everybody asks is, how the heck did that happen? Well, you know, it was just one day at a time, but I was responsible for everything in my life. And when I realized that things, you know, that my life at Monsanto as a chemical engineer, where back in those days, every four years, there was booms and busts, and the chemical engineers would be hired in one year, and then, you know, four years later, you're getting laid off. I wanted to have backups. So I needed to trade my portfolio, build up my net worth. So I had a backup. So if I did get laid off, I could control my own destiny and live a year or two while I'm looking for another chemical engineering position in tough times. One thing leads to another, and pretty soon you're trading so much money, people notice it, and they want you to manage some of their money, and then you get sucked into the money management business, but you still take responsibility for making that decision to say, okay, I don't want chemical engineering anymore, I'm going to go be a money manager. That's all within your control if you're taking responsibility for everything in your life. And I think that's what entrepreneurs tend to do. Entrepreneurs tend to take control and they realize that they're making it happen. They're not going to wait for somebody to hand it to them. Yeah, my my father was always fond of saying that he just didn't want to have a gig where he had to say yes, sir, to an a-hole all day long. But that was, I... (laughs) Well, even with the money management business, you got clients. There's Uh, always somebody to answer to. We had money laundering audits when we were in the currency trading business where the IRS would come in and look at us, all sorts. There's always... You got to say say yes, sir, to them. Otherwise, you're in trouble. (laughs) Yeah, they'll stay for another week just because they'll make your life miserable. Hey, Tom, listen... I'm going to let you run, but I, I, I hope maybe we can do this again in the future. And, you know, maybe months from now, if you got some free time and I, maybe, I have a lot of free time. I'm retired now. I, I, I just maybe, have to maybe, schedule it because <laughs> as you found out when you tried to schedule me, uh, I'm the busiest retired guy you ever saw. I just finished four days of tournament golf. I, I, uh, I have a few weeks here where I'm back in the Scottsdale area and then I'm heading up to the mountains for fishing and uh, my summer life. So, Well, I promise, uh, I promise it won't be for a couple months, but I, <laughs> my, my idea, what I was just thinking about this, is what maybe we could do is I could say to everybody out there, I say, listen, I'd like to talk to Tom. You guys ask the questions. Give me a list of questions. I'll, we'll, we'll, you know, Bob wants to ask Tom this question. I think that might be fun. You know, we oh, keep, that'd be fun. I'd, I'd enjoy it. A different perspective than just uh, having to deal with my psychological issues. Who knows what guys issues I've got? Um, <laughs> and, anyways, Tom, I appreciate you uh, being here today, and uh, we will hopefully get this posted uh, right away. And I'm sure people will enjoy it. Yeah, thanks, Michael, and uh, keep up your great uh, Facebook posts. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. See ya. Bye bye. It doesn't stop there. My second podcast with Tom Bassett. Hello, Michael. Hey, Tom. How are you? Doing great. 
So I have uh, a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching them. I've been laughing as I read all these there. Yeah. Sa- it, sa- it, saved, it saved me today. I didn't have to work that hard. Well, I think we've hit on a, a new formula for the Michael Coville uh, interviews, I think, as long as uh, the person you're interviewing is uh, open to a wide range of whatever uh, is going to happen. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I don't necessarily have an order, but I figured, um, and I'm going to give an introduction earlier, so I don't think we need to keep telling them who you are. I think they're going to know by the time this is all established. But I, I have a quick question that I want to throw at you, Tom. You know, you you saw a, you saw a video that uh, posted on my site from a philosopher, a guy named Alan Watts, and you kind of, uh, you know, by your comment, you connected with that. The, the guy, the, basically the guy that said, if you, if money was no object, what would you do? How would you manifest your desires? How would you unfold your life? And I was wondering if maybe you, at the beginning of this, if you might kind of relate and talk to that, that little video. Well, it's something I learned probably sometime in my 20s, uh, which is now getting to be a lot of years ago. And it comes down to uh, somebody asking the question of, uh, what if you had more money? What would that get you? And you try to answer the question. And then you say, okay, what if you got that? Well, then I would be able to do this. And then and if you keep going long enough and the person asking the question just keeps hammering away and say, okay, so now let's give you that. And what do you have now? What And what it comes down to is happiness. It comes down to you can make a choice no matter what your lot in life. Uh, how, how many uh, poor people have we seen that have a smile on their face and they enjoy every day? And how many wealthy people have we seen that are just miserable? Uh, and it's, a, it's really a choice that each person has to make to just be happy. So I think that the, if money was no object, I think you can, it, it provides a lot of flexibility. It probably provides a little bit better chance at having proper nutrition or better ability to exercise and keep your body healthy. There's all those little things, but in the end, it, um, it can provide happiness as long as you allow it to. Yeah, I think that was a, a good way to maybe start this off because we have a lot of people that really want to ask questions, and I've got them all here in front of me, like seven or eight pages of questions uh, about making money, essentially through a trend-following system or, or, or trend-following style thinking. And I just thought it was important for you to kind of uh, put that out there at the beginning because ultimately, you know, you could, you're going to have a lot of answers and give a lot of feedback to people, but I think it's important that maybe they actually know what's important at the very top. Well, and I'll, I'll add to what I just got through saying and, and kind of dovetail it into what you just said, that say you want to be a, a good trend follower and you become a master at it. Um, so 20, 30 years go by and you're doing very well and you're managing your own money and you can still make your life miserable. You can uh, take some of the money and go buy some real estate and complicate your life or you could have you know five divorces or you could have all sorts of... Uh, um, extraneous things that w- that you allow to intrude on your happiness, and um, so just being a good trend follower doesn't somehow make you happy. You can choose to be happy before you become a trend follower, and you can choose to be happy after you're a successful trend follower. Yeah, I think that's I think it's a great way of saying it. Well, let me jump into some questions because I know no one wants to hear from me. So uh, <laughs> let me, fire away. <laughs> so this is from Dan Montag, and it says, Tom, how do you, Mister Serenity? Manage your emotions during a loser. Any changes today since the book, The New Market Wizards? Uh, uh, that's a good question, Dan. He's a smart guy. Uh, what I try to do is kind of a, a concept in my mind I sort of labeled anchor to the wind, if, if that makes any sense. I what I try to do is when I'm on a super fast winning streak and money is flowing in almost in record amounts and I almost can't believe it, I keep trying to force my mind into a place where I remember back to those struggle for four years to get my commodity account to even break even or the latest drawdown and how I felt during that drawdown. And I, what I try to do mentally is bring my enthusiasm back to neutral. 
And so the opposite is also true for Daniel. I try to, in losing periods, go back and um, remember those times when I was had every market on the page, you know, turned green and uh, making money hand over fist. And that tries to take my tries to take my depression or my uh, my uh, not my depression, but my uh, frustration, anxiety, anything that would go during a drawdown, and you're trying to remember back to those times when you had everything on your page green and everything making a lot of money, and it sort of brings you back to neutral again the other way. And the goal is is to try to go into each day just sort of dead neutral uh, and, and try to end each day about the same. It's just another piece of data in a long, long stream of thousands of days of trading over a lifetime that are all just data points and you when you step back and look at it from that distance it sort of calms you and it um, it calms you on the upside and it calms you on the downside it allows you to just think rationally yeah i'm going to also offer here too nick rosetto had a question which is which is basically the same so i'm not going to ask it but i at least wanted to give nick the call out that uh, his question was basically the same as Dan's. So there's a, there's a, let's see, where's the, there's this one from Bruce Stock and says, Tom, you know, you conclude most of your Facebook posts with the expression, enjoy the ride. And he, he is asking what drove you to that conclusion. And maybe was there a, a period in uh, your life where it was a challenge to enjoy the ride? Uh, good question. Uh, I usually put enjoy the ride to remind all those traders out there that there's no final destination to all of this. Uh, I mean, we all uh, eventually uh, are going to pass away. (laughs) We're not going to be trend followers anymore. We're going to be dead. I think you need to take every day and uh, see the magical things that happen around you and uh, be open to uh, new ideas and observations about the world that exists out there and that's what it's all about i think uh trying to get to some final destination and uh, putting yourself through hell to get there um when the destination may not be quite what you think it is or uh, might be a little disappointing when you, when reality sets in and uh, uh you know you get there and you say well is this all there is uh enjoying the ride is everything to me i start each day with uh, you know i can't wait to attack it and uh this morning i was hitting golf balls playing with a new concept for about two hours and 10 minutes or so and just uh, enjoying a beautiful scottsdale morning and uh, i was the only one on the range it was very quiet it was beautiful and that's what enjoying the ride's all about it's not just about trading your brains out yeah, it's funny i i had a uh right before we started today i, I did a, a yoga session with a with a teacher and it was about an hour and a half two hours long and at the very end as i'm laying on my back eyes closed she basically just read a passage that was almost verbatim for what you just said uh it literally just uh, uh, almost verbatim the, the moment of now uh enjoy the journey uh and it it will all be over at some point in time so try not to live in the future don't live in the past and and you got right now mm-hmm. exactly what was the second part of that there was something about enjoy the ride but then Oh, uh, hold on. Okay, let's see. <laughs> As I'm looking I, at seven pages. Okay, his his uh was there a ch- was was there a period in your life where there was a challenge to enjoying the ride that really stands out? Yes, uh, probably. Uh, and that was probably before I understood a lot about myself. And probably in my twenties, uh, I was working as a chemical engineer. I was trying to get an MBA. I was designing a custom home that I was about to build four years later out in the woods southwest of St. Louis. I was starting up uh, Kennedy Capital, which is a stock manager uh, investment advisory firm in uh, St. Lu- St. Louis, and I was also trading commodities. That was a <laughs> pretty much wake up in the morning, go hard all day, and then uh, fall asleep exhausted and get up and do it again. Weekends, when I wasn't working as a Monsanto uh, engineer, I would uh, spend my time doing my research on my commodity account and try to improve what I was doing in my stock trading and so my research projects. And this is pre-microcomputer, so you're doing a lot of stuff with a calculator. You're really uh, running your eyes and, um, and you're not enjoying the ride a lot, uh, but you realize that you're trying to get through it. And 
I think uh, at this stage of life, both from an energy level, my age being 60 and all, um, I think I pace myself a whole lot better. I do take on a lot of things and sometimes find myself rushing a little bit, but there's always that time in the day where I say, okay, time to put it away and go do something fun. Um, so I always try to get a little bit of enjoying the ride-ins every day if I can do it. You know, I'm also I'm looking at some of these other questions. Uh, Fred Penny uh, basically asked a, a, a psych-type question, a trading psychology-type question that is right in line with what you're saying. And I, I just want to try and call people out because some of the questions are very similar. Um, let me jump into – where's the one that I wanted to get to here? I'm going to go to kind of to the top. So I think this was actually – might have been the first. Was this the first question? I think so, maybe. Um, so uh, Larry Tintarelli. Larry says, you know, can you ask Tom about his exit strategies on winning positions? Okay. Um, you know, a lot of traders know to, you know to use stops for losers, but exiting winners can be a bit trickier. So we are, I'm going to jump back into some more fun psych stuff, uh, for, for lack of a better term, but I, I thought that might be a good kind of meat and potatoes question to jump into. Okay. Larry, uh He's a smart trader himself. I listened to his podcast and loved it. The uh, The answer to Larry's question is pretty simple. I don't look at a whole lot of difference between a winning trade and a losing trade. I think of it in terms of if the direction is up today, I want to be long, and I want to put a stop uh, sell behind that position. And as long as the direction continues to be up, I'm either keeping the stop where it was or moving it in the direction of up. So I'm moving it up behind the position. When the direction shifts and goes the other way, the stop eventually gets hit and the down direction uh, is now in place and I wouldn't want to be in the position anymore. So I try to simplify it down to something uh, that simple. I don't try to uh, try to second guess and say, okay, well, this position's, you know, I had 20% and therefore I should do something different in terms of trying to take the profit or whatever. I just let it run. I, I remember a, a very famous question of Ed Sakota back. I, I was listening to a talk he was giving probably when I was in my 30s, I'm thinking. And uh, the person asked Ed, uh, well, what's your objective when you get into a trade? And uh, Ed looked at him and said, uh, pretty much the moon. When I get into the trade, I'm hoping this thing uh, goes long and and I'm going to be in it the rest of my life and I never have to do another trade. I mean, that's a good answer. There's no reason to think it couldn't. Um, reality would say that I've never had that happen yet, but, <laughs> you know, let them run. And, just, so. and have a plan if it doesn't run. If it doesn't run, it's going to hit the stop and change direction then with a loss. If it runs and then falters and changes direction you're going to hit the stop and switch to a you know and have a profit uh, but it's the same exact trade as far as i'm concerned i don't try to differentiate it i know some people do and i don't see any reason why you couldn't look at that as a research project but uh, it just never made any sense a psychological to me, uh, you know, psychologically, if the direction's down, I don't want to be in it. I don't care whether I have a profit or a loss. I just don't want to be in it. So Clint Stevens and Steve Burns both have question on hedges. And I'll read Steve's question here. He says, I would like to hear uh, Tom's thoughts on the edge he has in his trading method by using hedges to decrease losses and downtrends instead of exiting his long positions. And uh, Clint was essentially asking a, a very similar question on your use of hedges for your edge as well. Okay. Well, it takes a little time, but it's pretty simple. Uh, say you take a uh, any kind of strategy you want, whether it be purely technical, partially fundamental. I like to screen um, stocks and ETFs based on a little bit of fundamentals. Uh, if I'm looking for a high dividend, you know, yield would be a, a factor you could screen positions on, for instance. Uh, valuations like PE ratios and things like that, I'd rather pay something a little bit cheaper than buy something extremely pricey. Uh, that being said, let's say I'm smart enough to put together a diversified portfolio of longs. And let's say we do that last September, just for the sake of argument here. I just happened to look, because I was closing down my market stuff just before you called, 
my equity in my stock portfolio, which has been hedged quite a lot of the last few months, is exactly the same as it was in mid-September. It hasn't gone up or down a nickel. Uh, but what has happened is I put hedges on every time a down direction occurs. And I've taken them off every time an up direction occurs. All right. And what happens is time is clicking by on all those wonderful positions I put in place. So you're getting closer to long-term capital gains, which I can use for charitable contributions, or I can get a, a better tax rate on. Meanwhile, on my hedges, I'm short selling the SPY ETFs, which um, is very, very liquid. I can short anytime I wish. I can take off anytime I wish. It trades sometimes like 30 times a second. And what you're doing is buffering your portfolio with the SPYs at the same time that your long positions have the ability to, over the long run, become a long-term capital gain and to allow their alpha, if you've done your job right, picking them to um, sort of go through every up and down and show that they can do something for you. So that's where the edge comes in. You have the long-term gain and the taxes there against the short-term nature of the hedges. Let me go ahead and jump in because we got a long we got a long list here. So I know uh, <laughs> I so, did really block off the afternoon just in case. <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> I'm still sitting here as a sweaty mess from yoga too. <laughs> um, so uh, this is from. We are, uh, we are using video on this. It's just audio. Yeah, they don't want to look at me right now. That's for sure. Um, but but I'm, I, once I get to the point, I can do handstands. I am going to try and do some of these uh, while I'm in a handstand. And so maybe I can ask questions. I've never really tried to read upside down, but I will try. Yeah. Um, so that that'll be something new uh, for for another another a New Year podcast. For there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I will be somewhere in Thailand because I'm going to Asia February first. I don't know for how long or whatever, but so maybe somewhere in Thailand in a really good scenic view, I can get upside down and do a Skype call with you uh, video sometime in the new year, Tom. That'd be really fun. Be fun. <laughs> so, anyways, this is from Brandon Bruckman and Andreas Sis also ask a very similar question about uh, says Tom during the strategy development and testing process what metrics gave you confidence in your system and what process did you follow in taking a developed system from testing to live trading I think it was probably a, uh, wow okay it's not a short answer I know no oh, I know some of these are a little bit more they're good and they're good questions but they uh, they require a little bit of history and uh, kind of blocking through the process when we came up with a concept at Trendstat in the day, um, we were trying to figure out whether it added value or not. There was a number of different things we did. First of all, we had a set database of cleaned up data that we went through and painstakingly made sure there was no anomalies, like for instance, uh, a, a close or an open that was outside the high-low range is an obvious one that you find in databases all the time. And that can't happen. If you got an open and a close, it's got to be within the high-low range <laughs> or something's wrong. So we'd have the cleaned up data and we would go through and take the concept and program the actual indicator that says buy here, sell there, or do whatever you know the indicator is trying to do. Then we would try to have some metrics. We primarily looked at largest drawdown, average drawdown, time to recoveries, and we looked a lot at return to risk ratios, and we, we'd measure risk by uh, return to drawdown. We'd measure at return to volatility of the returns, those types of things. And all of that is great, but I can tell you that in reality, the thing that helped me the most feel comfortable with any kind of new indicator was when I would go into my office, tell my secretary, Lisa, to sh I'm shutting the door and I'm going to be going down this uh, research result. And unless it's an emergency, don't bother me. And I would take a ruler and I would start with page one, put the ruler on there, and I would read what the market did that day. And I would read what the results from the strategy were that day. And I would ask myself this one question. Did that strategy perform that day 
like you would have expected it given the type of market that you had that day. And it's very important to understand it to that level, I think, because in the end, that's what causes trend followers or any traders for that matter, systems traders primarily, uh, to let go of their system and abandon it when it's having a rough two weeks or a month or six months or a year. I know one of the questions was, what do you do in a, when your strategy is not working? Well, to me, as long as if you looked at the data of the, the last couple months of the market, let's say, and you said, based on the strategy and the way I set my strategy up, I would have expected my strategy to have a difficult period in the last couple months. Well, then it's not broken. Don't fix it. Just let it keep going. Let, wait for the good times. Good times are somewhere in the future, probably. I think a lot of people take a drawdown as it's not working anymore. None of my strategies, maybe there's ways of doing this, I, none of my strategies, including when I had all of them together and add them together, ever got to the point where I never had a, a losing day. They're always going to have losing days. So when I looked at it, I said, geez, you know, as long as if I'm having a choppy sideways market and I've got a trend following model that's getting chopped up a little bit in the sideways market, well, that's what I would expect. Let's wait until the next trending market and I'll be fine. And I think that's really, I got that level of knowledge by going through day after day after day. And I would just sit there with, I'm talking thick pieces of computer paper and just take a ruler and go down the page and look at every day's of data. It would take me hours. But when I got to that level and I thought, I understand it, it's working. I, I understand exactly how it's going to react to a lot of different things. And the metrics look okay. Let's, let's go turn it on and uh, put some real money with it. Well, let me let me throw in as a follow up here, um, Jim Byers, and you were just mentioning drawdown and uh, how it really can't be avoided. And so Jim asked the prescient question. He says he he wants to know if you can describe what you learn from your earliest large drawdown. <laughs> yeah, that was an easy one to remember. Um, it was a silver trade. Uh, I think it was documented maybe in the Market Wizards interview. I can't remember now, but I. I was merrily going along my way, and um, I put on a couple of, I think my portfolio had gotten up, and my futures portfolio was about a couple hundred thousand or something like that, 100,000 maybe. And I got into a couple different silver contracts, and this was the time when hunts were trying to corner silver. I didn't know it at the time, but it turned out to be that time. So silver went through the roof, and it exceeded any expectation I would ever have. But being the good trend follower I was at that point, I was going to hold on for dear life and, and just go up and down and whichever way the market went, I was just going to keep moving my stops as the stops could be justified. My stops got pretty far away uh, because the market was going so fast uh, upward. And at one point, I noticed that my equity in this little $100,000 futures account had gotten to something like 600000 or 500000 something like ridiculous. I had made four or 500%. I'm still hanging on to the same exact positions. That's when the major drawdown occurred. I got out of the position, and I, my portfolio ended up uh, probably about a quarter of a million or 300000 or something. I had lost two hundred. 300,000 just ex in a matter of weeks when they broke apart the corner and reduced or increased the margins and the whole thing just fell apart and went limit down, you know, day after day after day. And what I learned from that was that uh, volatility as a percent of the equity in my portfolio need not change. What I mean by that is I had several different silver contracts. There was no reason why I couldn't stay, stay with that silver trade and be a good trend follower and ride it to the bitter end. But I didn't need to hold the same number of contracts at the end as I had when I started out. I could peel off contracts as I went so that it reduces the volatility to the portfolio, but still gave me a significant silver position. That way, the portfolio acts more like a portfolio instead of 15 things in a silver position, where the silver position drives the whole portfolio up or down every day, and the rest of them doesn't make a difference at all. 
by by volatility adjusting my positions uh, on an ongoing basis, and I did it with the computers at Trendstat every day. We uh, we could take eighty different commodity markets traded by multiple different systems, and the computers could just tell us where the volatility of equity uh, per equity of every single position should be, so that all of the portfolios acted like portfolios, and no one market could really dominate too much what was going on that day. And uh, that's what I learned from it. It was a very valuable lesson uh, that sort of expounded or expanded into uh, risk controls as a percent of equity, margin as a percent of equity. And by the, you know, the end of Trendset, we had lots of different ways of trying to control position sizing and make that position sizing, the bottom line of the position sizing was so that every position had a meaningful impact on the portfolio, not a small amount, not a large amount, a meaningful amount. And when you get to that level, then you're truly you know, managing the portfolio. You know, I was going to ask, I'm going to come back to it. Uh, Clint Stevens has a question where he was talking about uh, returns plus serenity versus just going only for returns. I'm going to jump back to that, but I want to uh, Eric Spinneman and Rudy Widjaja both have questions that revolve around your use of money management, uh, the types of money management, how you approach uh, risk control, and whether you pyramid at all. And so both uh, both of those guys had a similar question there. All right. Well, uh, I viewed money management, uh, easy calculation, take the risk to your stop loss of where you are at any point in time. Multiply it times the number of contracts. That's your dollar of risk in that position. Divide it by the equity in your portfolio. And that's the percent of your portfolio that's at, at risk at that point due to that one position. You could do the same thing with volatility. You take the volatility of any one position times the number of contracts. Volatility for me was the average true range of uh, over the last 20 days. Divide it by the equity, you get a margin or a volatility as a percent of equity. Margin, you can do the same thing. How much margin per position times the number of contracts divided by the equity, you have margin per equity. You can set fixed levels for every one of those three things. And by doing so, you can do a calculation where the computer says, if I exceed the limits on any of these, I'm going to sell off enough positions to get me back down underneath all of those limits. And I even went to the point where I had initial position limits and I had uh, ongoing uh, existing position limits because when a position becomes profitable and starts running, it's by its very nature going to take on a little extra volatility, a little extra risk, but you've got a winning position now and it's going your way. You want to let it run. So we found that we, uh, we came up with a level for initial position risk and initial uh, volatility risk as a percent of equity and sized our portfolios. Then as the markets would run our way, we would allow it a little more room. As it got above those levels, we would just start stripping off uh, contracts until we got back to the point where it was uh, in the limits. And yet we would always let our positions run, as Ed Sequoia would say, uh, to the moon. Well, I'm going to keep jumping here. we got lots of stuff to cover <laughs> when everyone wants their questions answered. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, Ross, Ross Hendricks and Matthew Fry both have questions about uh, system testing. And Ross coming, it looks like from a beginning standpoint, is really saying, um, what kind of advice could you give to the first-time uh, programmer looking to perhaps backtest for the first time? And Matthew's taking it a step further, and he's saying, do you believe in walk, walking a system forward? If not, what metrics are best used to monitor the health of your edge, and how do you know when you might make a change? So Ross is really asking, how do I get started as a beginner and per perhaps programming my system? And Matthew's saying, you know, I uh, want some comment on walking a system forward, and how do you know uh, when a change might be needed? Good questions all. Starting out, I had, I guess, the good fortune in my case to be a chemical engineer. So I took Fortran programming and basic programming and understood what a, a program was all about. Uh, I was not born with a knowledge of programming, I would point out. Uh, and I don't think any of the people on the Facebook page 
were born with a knowledge of programming, but these are learned skills. You can buy books on it. You can take classes in it. Uh, I would recommend when you're starting out, take a good look at some, something as simple as an Excel spreadsheet. For a lot of things that I do anymore, since I don't have uh, full-time programming staff at Trendstat being in retirement and all, a lot of the stuff I do nowadays, I just do on the Excel spreadsheets. They've gotten so powerful and so capable. I mean, with the, the gigabytes of hard drive that we have on our computers and, uh, and on the, the height processing speeds that we have, you can do an awfully a lot of stuff on an Excel spreadsheet uh, today that I could not even program in BASIC back on my you know, IBM PC back in the old days or my Trash 80 back in, what was it, 1980 probably. The computers are pretty powerful on a small basis. So uh, consider the Excel spreadsheet, maybe start there. Uh, you can see what's going on a little easier. If you want to try to get a little fancy inside of Excel spreadsheets, they allow a little visual basic type of um, modules that you can install in there to do fancier things. Uh, there's lots of courses and books available on that type of stuff. That's probably where I'd start. A lot of the canned strategy programs can give you sort of um, some tools to look at some things. My worry is, is that a lot of those tend to not be geared to exactly the way you're going to end up trading. So it's giving you a little bit of a not a realistic view of what it is that you're about to embark on. And uh, what I mean by that is sometimes these CAN programs don't have the same position sizing that you're going to have. So they might be based on one contract, and the one contract is always one contract. And so you get the results of one contract, but you don't get the effect of money management in there and all that. So you get a sort of a weird uh, look at history, and you might become tainted good or bad by that. And uh, when you're in, when you're looking at history, you want to become comfortable with your strategy versus various types of markets. You do not want to get to the point where you just fall in love with some strategy based on some simulation that was not even done in a uh, rigorous fashion. And then all of a sudden it, it's falling apart in the future and you don't have that comfort level that you need to stick it out. That's how I would start out. And on the walking forward question, walking forward to me is a term that describes for those who haven't run, run into the term before, sort of taking a section of time, running a strategy, and then coming out with the results of that strategy and using that particular database to re-optimize somehow your parameters. And then you're going to go attack the next part of the database and see what its results are. And then use that second section of data to optimize the parameters. And then you're going to walk that forward to the third chunk of data and so on. I thought that seemed a bit clunky in that that's not the way real world works. I don't uh, you know, to me, every day was another day, and I wanted to just continue to have things. If the, if things need to change, for instance, an example, true range, average true range over 20 days changes every day. So if you want to think about it, if you have average true range as one, is your, one of your parameters, it's walking forward every day, and day after day, you're getting a new 20-day period, a new average true range, and things are changing each day. So you're walking it forward uh, based on that. And that's more, that's more close to what you actually do in trading every day. So I like that type of strategy better than blocking off large sections of data and optimizing that section and then using it on the next chunk of data. Uh, so I would encourage people, if you want to think of it as walking forward every day, um, that's fine with me. Uh, you can certainly do that with your historical databases by calculating the average true range of every 20-day period, and then you just start going through the database and make your decisions and make your money management calls and let the databases uh, keep track of it all, and you're in good shape. So I got a question here from Andrew Derbyshire, and essentially what he's asking is you started to excel in the world of trend following, and, and of course, the, the vast majority of market participants are uh, are still in a 
an orientation that's more maybe value or fundamentals or buy and hold is that if you would get the skeptics and he references something that I did on a podcast where I combined four interviews that David Harding gave on CNBC and I offered some comments and during those interviews, they really didn't seem to really get what Harding did, uh, even though you, you would think they might have done a little homework before they had him on, but on four separate occasions. But one of the occasions, and I'm not saying this to kind of like say anything negative about somebody, but on one of the occasions, Joe Kernan of CNBC was essentially uh, implying or making reference that uh, that trend following or what David Harding did uh, was very analogous to long-term capital management. And so I guess what Andrew is asking about is 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 skeptics um, and how you might have handled skeptics in the past and perhaps uh, even skepticism towards trend following that, for example, how Harding was having to handle that on CNBC. Uh, that's a good question, too. And we certainly had our skeptics and they still exist out there. And probably that's one of the reasons why it still works so well. If everybody believed in it, it probably wouldn't work so well. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what I ended up having to do in the later stages of my career, I did some studies that looked at where did trend followers make money and where did they lose it. I came up with the concept of taking the monthly returns on an assorted portfolio of 20 or 30 different commodities. And I measured the amount of absolute change in direction in any one market. And then I put that against the profits that CTAs got during those periods. And I did this first with our own Trendstep portfolios because I had the detail of market by market by market. I did it later on a macro basis by saying, what were the average prices of a whole portfolio of things, high or low? And what were the profits from CTA industry, high or low? And we found a definite correlation that when markets move, tr CTAs make money or trend followers make money. I think that that should be very logical. I don't see why anybody could disagree with it. I don't see why anybody would think that wouldn't work. So then the question becomes, are you going to have market movement or are markets just going to sit in one place for the next 20 years? If you knew that markets were not going to go anywhere for 20 years, I don't think you probably want to be a trend follower. You probably don't want to be a trader. You can't make much money if the market isn't going to move anything because you've got to buy one price and sell at a higher price or sell at a higher price and buy at a lower price. But if the market doesn't move at all, you aren't going to get a higher or a lower price. You're going to get the same price. It seems to me markets have to move. And it seems to me also over my lifetime, thanks to computers and lots more participa participation in the markets and so on, all the forces that come together, there's been more volatility rather than less. So there is more potential for things to explode to ridiculously high levels. You've got now uh, the currency being somewhat devaluated with uh, with all this QE nonsense, I think, that I'm dead against. If the dollar keeps getting more and more worthless and things like crude oil are based on dollar, then you know people in the Middle East or wherever are going to want more dollars for the same amount of oil that they're selling us. And it seems to me we're going to end up paying it sooner or later. Therefore, you've got this bias for things to go outside the range that they've ever been in before. Uh, be just because the, the currency that it's based on is, uh, is kind of going outside of where it's been before as well. Given all that, it seems to me that that's where trend followers like David Harding are going to just over time continue to make money and why people like CNBC and, and uh, some of the people on the, the interview shows who spend their whole day, you've got to realize, in front of the cameras talking about what is happening up on this ticker board that's behind them or in front of them. And they they can't see the forest for the trees. They're, they're looking at the noise all day long and then trying to ask uh, David Harding, a guy who's thinking in terms of lifetimes, uh, a question which he answers very eloquently and they don't get it because they can't see beside, you know, they're looking at the last five minutes of what the Dow did or whatever. It's, I think that's where the disconnect becomes. And, and in terms of where I see the edge for trend followers is just simply my bias that I think there will be more volatility in the future rather than less. And I think there's going to be a lot more big moves 
in the future than less. And you have to put up with the nonsense uh, in between. As you were talking about some of the talking heads and the news shows, I, I've i had one, I mean, I've had a lot of interesting experiences, but I, one interesting experience comes to mind was being invited to CNBC uh, to speak with producers, to have them, unbeknownst to me at the time, they wanted me to pitch them a, a show on the spot. And I remember walking through that studio, and it was so interesting because there's this big bullpen area of all these reporters, you know, sit, the people that you see on TV, you know, they go back to their computers and they start typing away, doing whatever. And then over off to the side is the is is the set. So, you know, as, as a viewer, you're sitting there and you see this this nice little TV uh, window of what's going on. But as an, as when you're inside the studio and you look at it, you realize, wow, this is all uh, to, to, to steal from your background a little bit. This is all very engineered. This is all very fake. This isn't real. Uh, and if you yeah. can, if you stand there and you see it in live in, in living color, it's much different than flipping on the TV and seeing what they want you to see within the confines of the borders of your screen. Mm-hmm. It's quite and interesting. A lot, and a lot of it's just geared to talking about noise. Yeah. Why would anybody tuning in want to hear something from David Harding on a strategy that would require a tremendous amount of work to put together? you know, cover the next, you know, decade or something, uh, instead of, uh, I want to know why the Dow's down 50 points today. Right. When are they going to get to that? That's what I want to know. Right. You know, so that's kind of the average Joe just doesn't get it. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't think CNBC would be a place where professional traders would go for ideas, except maybe <laughs> what to do the opposite of or something. Well, I guess maybe if they see an interview with David Harding and they've never heard those types of answers and, and that type of thought process, maybe they'd be like, well, maybe I better find out who this guy is and what he does and maybe I can learn something. Yeah, but they it would require you having enough knowledge to separate the good pieces of information, David, from the bad pieces of information, which would be you know the announcers that are uh, asking him the questions. Yeah. Uh, touche, yeah. touche. <laughs> and if you knew that, you probably didn't need to go <laughs> right. talk to David Harding. <laughs> exactly. There you go. That's that's catch twenty two, huh? Um, yeah. So, so I have a question here from uh, Clint Stevens, and Clint says, uh, you know, in, in Jack Schwager's book and the Market Wizards book, it suggests that you were not included in the book on a return basis alone, but for this combination of quote serenity, a nice way of life plus returns. So Clint wants to know. Your development of your trading approach and how you run your life from the ground up was the notion of serenity and not being a crazed, you know, overweight, overworked trader sitting there nonstop, no life. Was that thought of from the very beginning yes. as you were as you were going to lay out a life in front of you? Yes, it was uh, to a large extent. The it's slightly different than you would expect, though, um, in that my view, I think we might even covered this in the last interview briefly, uh, my view of my job as a money manager was to manage client assets. It wasn't to manage my assets. So when I talk to clients and I ask them what they like and what they don't like, and I listen to client complaints over the years about, oh, I'm firing you because of this, why, you know, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. You learn as a money manager that really the average client out there, sadly, does not allow their uh, money manager that they hired to do what that money manager is capable of. Because if you do and you go up and down too much, it makes the clients nervous, they fire you. And they always want to chase after the returns and give you the money when it's high on your equity curve. And when your equity curve's gone through a drawdown, they want to pull it out. So it's very self-defeating from the standpoint of performance fees. It's very self-defeating from the standpoint of clients making actual returns on investments. It comes down to something I, I determined very early on in the process, that it was my job to try to make the clients as good a client as I could so that they would allow me to be the best money manager I could be. When you do that, you start designing your strategies around the client, not around you. Now, because clients had a lot less risk tolerance than I did, 
it indirectly fed into my quality of life because I created strategies that were a lot tamer, that had a lot less uh, variation. I, I attempted to try to stick to return to risk ratios that were uh, good and, and sort of boring. And, and, and the reason Jack, when he looked at my stuff, uh, he kept having people say, you should really interview Tom. He's a very interesting guy. And Jack, being the caffeinated New Yorker that at the time working for Prudential Base uh, Futures and director of research, I believe, he, um, you know, you got to picture yourself in his position. He's looking for the sizzle that'll sell the Market Wizards books and trying to find all these guys that have created, you know, quadruple hundreds, thousands percent returns and are legends uh, on the street that sells books. And my story isn't that compelling. It's an engineer that turns into a money manager who's got some kind of tame returns and just kind of cruises along. So from a surface uh, outside, Jack didn't see much there of interest. But when people kept telling him over and over again, he needed to interview me. He kept getting kind of puzzled over what the heck is everybody think that's so, you know, uh, interesting about Tom. And when he got done interviewing me and found out how I designed everything to have a life and that I had a, a really fun life, and he realized sort of wistfully, I think, that he hadn't figured out how to do that for himself yet, I think he sort of indicated to me that out of all of the two books that he wrote on the Market Wizards up to that point, my style of trading probably in the end would be something he would be most interested in following versus all the others because it led to a sort of a peacefulness and a control of the trading process to the point where there wasn't a lot of angst. And I think Jack originally came to trading thinking there has to be stress, there has to be, you know, it's a much, much more macho type of endeavor and you got to go for big returns and you got to suck it up and you got to, you know, ride the equity curve, do all these things you got to do. And it was all nonsense, really. It just, his own biases led to that. And I kind of opened up his eyes to uh, another world. You know, I'm, I'm going to add uh, completely unrelated, but I think it's kind of a lifestyle choice that I saw someone in my family make. And this would be my father. And my father is a dentist. And he decided even in his 20s, before he had any practice to speak of, before he had any real grand revenue coming in the door or anything, he decided as a very young man that he was going to work a four-day work week. And he's taken off Friday every uh, every week. And that, that he built that into his system, so to speak, as a young man. So I think there are ways, you know, techniques and, and ideas that we can think about doing things differently. And I get back to the, uh, to the Alan Watts video that I discussed at the very beginning, the guy that was bringing a lot of Eastern thoughts to the Western world, which is, you know, how can you structure your life differently? And, and, and think about it early on. Don't just get stuck on the treadmill. Mm -hmm, exactly. And to finish the answer to the question, let's say, he continued on and said, how has that evolved? Well, now I'm in retirement. Now, Trendstat's no longer there. I don't have a staff of 10. I don't have 40 computers. I have one PC that I pretty much do most of my work on, and we're talking on another PC right now. I have to think to myself, all right, let's see now. I don't have the staff. I don't have the backups, but I need to create good trading strategies. So I morphed into a different style of trading and different markets that I trade now, some of which are due to, like, I never traded orange juice at Trendset because we were too big, but now I can trade orange juice, so I trade orange juice. Now, we only have one contract on. It's not a big deal. And uh, so you, you adjust with the conditions that exist at the time, and what do I want out of retirement? Well, I want to be able to go hit golf balls today for two hours plus. I don't want to be tied to sitting here in front of the computer all day and, uh, you know, looking at charts and ruining my eyes. I hate, you know, I'd, I'd rather go out and prune trees in the backyard and uh, you know, plant some flowers and go work out and go for a hike and go play golf and all these other things that I like to do. So why, if I'm going to, to, to create a trading strategy and I, and I have, I know the amount of money I'm going to try to deal with. I know my skill level. I know my resources of what kind of computers I have and what kind of software I have. And I know what kind of market data I'm getting in. Why don't I design something that works for my lifestyle so that my lifestyle is exactly what I want it to be? And yet I can still 
apply good trading strategy and principles to uh, to my trading. And I think that's simple to do if you just start from the uh, question, how do I want my trading stat- strategy to operate uh, and then fit with my lifestyle? I've often said, if you're a traveling salesman, you're on the road five days a week, and you're home on weekends, why not do a Saturday morning trading style where you take once a week data, you look at it Saturday morning, you make your decisions, you send them in electronically, and then you go on the road Sunday night again. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's. I think it's surprising. It's actually been surprising to me in the last couple of years how many uh, large funds, large trend-following funds, uh, use weekly bar systems. Absolutely. It gives you a different angle. And, you know, when you're a very large CTA, I think one of the reasons why some of them are, are struggling is the dollars that they're managing is just so huge. They affect the market when they go in and out. So they have to start getting in or out over two, three days and going to weekly charts and doing all sorts of things. And as long as you do the rest of the work on risk control and portfolio diversification and other things, there's no reason to think you can't be successful might change your return stream or your return to risk profile a little bit. But that's what these big guys have to do because they just cannot afford to make any trade that is not an essential trade because they just can't, they got too much money. And it's, it's hard as a CTA when you got a lot of different forces trying to shove money at you and your employees trying to, you know, make a career of being in the business and you're trying to expand and go into new markets and all those things. You, it's really hard to turn down money coming in. You have to really set some of your own personal levels and say, no, this is going to be a hundred million and we're going to shut it down at a hundred million. And if it gets above a hundred million, we're going to start sending money back to you all. A lot of CTAs have done that, but it really does give an indication that you're kind of uh, choking on the amount of money that you're managing. And so, you know, allocators that are giving you the money are starting to think, geez, this guy's sending money back. That means he's really struggling to try to get the money invested. Or maybe they say he's being he's being true to us and, and not diluting our returns by trading once a week and something. So it has two sides of the story, but it's something that brings up a sort of a spotlight on that trader and he has to be able to withstand the scrutiny and explain why he's sending money back. But some people just don't, and then the returns sort of get diluted over time. Yeah, you, know, you bring up bring up a, uh, a good point. Maybe not necessarily where you were going, but it made me think about the idea that uh, the idea of the trading strategy and then the money management business. And one of the things that I've done in my books, to some degree, there's a there's a positive to this, and then there's a negative. But it's great to show the uh, validity of a trading strategy by looking at all these different traders that have these historical track records. And you can say, well, look, look at how this has performed over many, many decades. And that's fantastic. But your point also, when you start to talk about the money under management and and assets and the money management business, frankly, I don't think most people, most, not that you were doing this on, you know, you weren't doing this on purpose, but I think most people... Uh, just they really want to know about the trading strategy. I think some, sometimes what happens is is the the money management gets blended into the to the two of them. And like here, you describe your life today. Your life today is a uh, is is one man, no staff, and a nice life. And I, I think sometimes you know when 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 I receive questions from people, they want to talk about well, did you see this? I mean, for example, John W. Henry recently closing down his shop. You know, for me, it's hard to criticize a man who was in this space for thirty years. Uh, very successful had survived yeah had survived H- huge assets under management and you know then he decides he wants to go to another business uh, completely unrelated makes a fortune in that and then is it surprising necessarily that he that he maybe doesn't have every ball in the world bouncing up in multiple fortune 500 businesses so i i think it's sometimes you just need to step back a little bit for perspective on this kind of thing yeah you do you really do and I think John Henry is a good example. I mean, he ran a little bit more leverage than, than I would have run. Uh, so he had a little bit more up and down, but, you know, he was able to continue to attract attention and, uh, and had enough marketing capability or sales capability that it, he was able to keep the business running for a long, long time. Hats off to him for doing it. And yeah. I, I think in the end, uh, everybody should consider what, what does John Henry want to do with his day? Does he want to, you know, manage a, a futures trading firm that he doesn't have a whole lot of interest in. It's just a big liability and he's got a very deep pocket. So why uh, put yourself through that liability? 
Yeah, I, I mean, and I and I think that's it's it's if people think about it, it's cut, it's not necessarily surprising if like just like you, you've made this transition, and it's almost I knew this years ago. When the moment John bought the team, you say, well, you know, he's obviously he's he's interested in other stuff too, and it's it's kind of hard to be interested in two very big things like that in one in one lifetime. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, so and Larry, who knows? He may be uh, looking at something else completely different that we don't even know about. And you have to salute that. You just have to, and once yeah. again, the moment of now, and you adjust to the situation. And uh, I just think it's a fantastic story. I, I so I, I, you know, look, you and I both know that there's a lot of armchair quarterbacks that that sit out there on the sidelines drinking a Budweiser, uh, you know, fifty pounds overweight, watching the football game, throwing out criticism. But you know, you got to mm-hmm. give you got to give props to the guy who's in the game and he's sweating away and he's making it happen. I have to salute that one hundred percent. Sure. So Larry has an, another question that I thought was great too. And uh, so you've got a coin flip uh, entry method experiment that you've done. And, and Larry wanted you to kind of uh, reiterate that because he thought it really, uh, the concept behind it, because what it does is it focuses people less on entries, which is the favorite thing for most traders when they're getting started. Like, you know, where do I get in? And it puts more emphasis on the exit and proper money management. Right. Uh, usually when novice traders start out, the biggest thing is to read a book on trading or, you know, they read trend following manifesto or something. They, they find out a lot about what is a moving average and what is an exponential moving average and what is a range breakout system and what is point and figure charting and on and on. And they get sucked into this buying and selling. And a lot of times with one contract, because that keeps the math simple and you can put it on a spreadsheet and off you go and you try different things and you find something that, you think works and off you off you magically go and hope that you're successful along the way of course i had my lessons that i'd learned on uh, money management started driving home the point in spades that uh, money management was far more important than the buying and selling stuff but everybody that would want to interview me as a potential money manager would want to know about my trading strategy not about my money management they always want it i mean the, the clients want to know more about what you're doing and I thought, you know, what I, had, I need to do is to once and for all shut up people about this nonsense of it's all about the trading strategy and it's not about the money management. So I developed a strategy where I took uh, our cleaned up databases and I think I, at the time I did it with, uh, I did it with I think five or six markets, maybe seven markets, something like that. I can't remember now, it's been so long. Uh, But it was replicated by some guys in Austria with about 30 markets. Same conclusion. In my study, I just said, okay, let's flip a coin, random number generator. Uh, At the end of the day, if we don't have a position, if it's heads, you buy. If it's tails, you sell. As soon as that position is put in place, you take a, a simple range breakout strategy. And if it's a sell, I put in a buy stop. If it's a buy, I put in a sell stop. I move it in the same direction as the trade goes. So you're truly just letting the trade run as long as you can until it hits the stop, and then you flip the coin again. What I found when I did that was over any run that I did, because it's it's random numbers (laughs) generator creating, so your buy and sell decisions are completely random and completely different every time you run it through. So we we ran it a hundred times and got different results every time. But the propensity over time, over lots and lots of runs, was that it slightly made money. Not a lot, but it made money. And the key to it was the balance in the portfolio is perfect. Each one of the seven positions had a meaningful impact on the portfolio. There wasn't one that was dominating or one that was dominating good or one dominating bad. They were meaningful. And all of the risk control was there with volatility control. All of the, we had money, we had the um, risk as a percent of equity limits. So we had all the number of contracts were perfectly balanced. That's what creates the, uh, the profits, the buying and selling don't make that money. You can use a coin flip and still make money. The guys in Austria, by the way, that ran it on 20 or 30 markets, I forget now, they actually made more money per year than I did with my coin flip because I only had seven markets. They might have been running a little bit more uh, portfolio uh, heat uh, in the in the end. 
uh, but they were actually they had made money too. Well, Tom, we are on the second. We're on the second half at least here. There's only so many more in front of us, so I, I will I will only keep you from the links for so much longer. <laughs> Oh, I'm all I'm all done with the links for today. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, this is a question from uh, Guru Prasad. Guru Prasad, I am not going to pronounce your last name because I will only butcher it. Um, so, uh, but he's he's got a real simple question here uh, within a larger question. He really wants to know about percent betting. He's talking about he feels comfortable at one percent, and I think he would really like to hear your your view on percent uh, of uh, capital bet on each trade and maybe how you view that choice of percent bet. Yeah, this is where I think it'd be very important for each trader to do his own simulations on percents. And we had limits, as I already said, on things like margin to equity, volatility to equity, risk to equity. And we had those specific numbers that we had uh, come to based on simulating how various leverages feed back into return streams and how much can the portfolio go up and down in a particular day, week, month, year? Uh, What kind of maximum drawdowns do you tend to get out of different portfolio heat levels and how much leverage? And so he's very perceptive. 1% is an area where probably we ran trend stat quite a bit. In some cases, some markets, we were down in the less than 1%, uh, very rarely where we were above it. And we pretty much on ongoing trade risks were up in the more like 2% ranges and stuff like that because you had a position that was now moving your direction, your stops are now been moved, and you're starting to get to the point where you're going to start letting it run as far as you can and a little more risk is fine. Uh, Excessive risk then is not fine. I think that's a question that each trader needs to uh, handle for himself. And an important thing to note is now that I'm in retirement and I have my wife and myself as our sole two clients, and she's happy with what I'm doing, um, I can run the portfolio, especially my futures portfolio, a little bit higher than 1% and feel very comfortable with it. Because I know what I'm doing. I know it's going to go up and down a little bit more, but I know I've controlled the amount of risk that I've got, and uh, that makes trading it a little bit faster. Not a big deal to me. You just want you want people to see what the range of possibilities are. Correct. You each trader should really try to simulate some trading ideas at different levels and try to dial it in, if anything, a little lower than you think you can tolerate. Because when in the heat of the battle and you're in that big major drawdown that you've never had before, having less of a drawdown will be better than having more of a drawdown. You want to kind of err on the conservative side, on the numbers. So if you can do your simulations and it comes out, well, I think I can do 2%, well, maybe do 1.5% just for the, for a while at least and see if you uh, you think that's okay. You don't need to be rushing out and trading 10% of your equity on a position. Giuseppe Luizzo, I hope I pronounced that right on the back end there, has a very straightforward and basic question, which has got a lot of weight behind it. How do you diversify your portfolio, Tom? Uh, that's a tough one uh, more and more in today's world because globally, we've gotten into so much electronic data, so many computers trading, so many different markets. It was very easy for Trendstat to manage something like 30 currency Forex markets, something like 80 futures markets, and about 25 mutual funds that we traded, and to do it with 10 people. Four of those people were doing development work. They weren't managing it. Only two were involved in the actual production of orders and running of the trades. So two people are handling hundreds of clients across hundreds of different positions by scores of different strategies. And it, it's easy to do every day. And I don't, you know, I think the afternoon runs would take maybe 10 minutes in the case of currencies, and then we'd run the rest of it in maybe 15 minutes. It wouldn't take that long at all. And I think think diversification is harder and harder to come by because in any one day, let's say you take a soybean contract and you take a gold contract. Well, theoretically, those two shouldn't have a whole lot to do with each other. So gold could go up and soybeans could go up, Gold could go up, soybeans could go down, on and on, all different possibilities. 
So you would hope that by having a soybean and a gold in your portfolio, you would have some diversification. But what's happened historically more and more, uh, and it's always during times of major news announcements, wars breaking out, collapse of this or a bubble bursting or whatever, you get these what I call lockstep periods where every market moves in a direction that's either 100% correlated with another market or 100% inversely correlated with another market and nothing in between. They are no longer independent. You will you look at your portfolio on a day when this major thing happens and all of a sudden you've got uh, your entire screen is green. Every position in your portfolio is green. You're making money across the board. Well, the very next day, a shift happens and everything is red. You're at 100% lockstep. You've got no diversification. You think you do, but you don't. The other situation I see a lot in the novice portfolios, they'll come in and say, well, I'm going to look at my portfolio. Okay, fine. It's some relative. It's a friend, whatever. And I'm looking at their their portfolio and they've uh, been sold by their broker or financial planner or numerous different growth stock mutual funds. I remember my sister had a portfolio she showed me and they had five different uh, mutual funds in their portfolio, three of which were just big old growth stock mutual funds. I said, well, you know, you don't have any diversification and they're all going to go up when the market goes up. They're all going to go down when the market goes down. You're going to buy and hold them. That's not diversification. Well, I have three different ones. Well, you know, that does not give me a diversification. The answer to it is a difficult one. You're trying to grind through all the different markets and how they trade against other markets over a time period. But in the back of your mind, you're also trying to say to yourself, when times of crisis exist and lockstep sets in on these markets, I better have my risk control schemes in place to limit my exposure, both good and bad, unfortunately, because I don't want the bad part of it to uh, to reside in my portfolio. But when I know that no matter what I do, I'm going to get zero diversification in the world because the markets are just so intercorrelated these days. So Chris May asks the sarcastic, where is gold going in the next six months? <laughs> I thought that was cute. <laughs> um, I think I've got, I, I'm down to three, the final three. And then we'll, uh, we'll, I appreciate all your time today and I'll, I'll, I'll let you run. But I've, I've got three left here. I've been, as I've been doing this, I've, if everyone's wondering, I've had like, Literally 15 pieces of paper in front of me trying to eliminate redundancies, combine people. And, <laughs> and so, so, there's a couple questions that just aren't going to get asked. I'm sorry. <laughs> a couple of you guys did not really think through a couple of these, and they're not getting asked. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so this is from Fred Penny. And he, this is a good question. He says, uh, what would cause you to stop trading a particular system? And then what might cause you to start trading that same system again? All right. What would cause me to stop trading a strategy would be the day that I realized that in market conditions that existed uh, in the recent history, the results I got from that trading strategy were different than I would have expected given the way that strategy had gone through those markets. Something happened that I did not expect. That's why I, I am so big on going through those day by day with the ruler concept uh, in the simulations. I needed to understand everything that happened and how that strategy worked and how it reacted to various types of movements so that as I'm going through life and I'm looking at the last two weeks or three weeks or four weeks and I'm seeing, a, let's say, a market that's going one direction and I'm a trend follower and I'm looking at this thing and it's not making any money, why is it not making money? Something's wrong. That's what would cause me to, uh, to stop trading a strategy and take a good look at it. If I could find why it was doing that and where I was wrong on my construction of the strategy somehow um, and feel comfortable making some change to it that would uh, solve that problem, then I would be immediately willing to, st to start it up again if, you know, went through the simulations and went through the line by line look on it and said, you know, this is ready for prime time. Let's get back into it. If I couldn't find why it was doing what it was, uh, you know, what was creating that anomaly, 
uh, between what I pictured to be the way it would act and the way it really act acted, uh, then I would I would just dismiss it. It would go to the uh, junk heap, and I'd move on with something new. So this is a you know as you as you mentioned that I'm kind of curious though because you're. Your background, the engineering background, uh, very analytical. Was there ever a side of you that, uh, or did you just naturally adapt to it because of your upbringing, training, whatnot, where, where the uncertainty that is always inherent in a strategy, especially these types of strategies, the uncertainty that that you were comfortable with that that range of possibilities, comfortable with that uncertainty, whereas so many people just want this. They, they want to believe that when they, when they line up with their system to trade, they're going to get 1% a month every month. Mm-hmm. And, and so the fact that you, 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 you really, I think anybody that starts to understand this world, this way of thinking has to really find peace with uncertainty. Yeah. I think the way to do it is to look at daily returns or some large amounts of data. I had, I don't know, 20 or 30 years of cleaned up data back in the day. And so we had huge, databases that we could go through and you start looking at daily data or even weekly or monthly data you, you're talking about so many data points if you throw them on like a bell curve or something you're, you're going to see a wide variety of different types of conditions and so i viewed my job as a money manager more as uh, managing all this random data coming in and just making good money management decisions and dealing with all the data and not getting too emotionally involved in, you know, what did the gold market do today? I don't really care. You know, it's just another piece of data I had to process. And I think that was a maybe the good fortune of being a more of a data processing mentality, a statistician mentality, an engineer mentality. It's kind of a puzzle but, for you to figure out. Yeah, I have always treated the, the whole money management concept and trading is to me is just a puzzle. It's just no different than trying to work a Sudoku or a crossword puzzle or you know, solve something, a brain teaser. It's it's a mental effort. It's like golf. You'll never achieve a perfect round of golf. Every time you get done, you say, you know, if I could have just made that putt on 17, I could have done this. And there's always a way to look ahead and say, you know, I can do better than this. And and I think trading's the same way. You never arrive at the final destination. You only sort of get better at it over your lifetime and then somewhere along the way you die and you can't get any better but <laughs> you never <laughs> you never achieve the final destination you never become the perfect trader yeah so howard fraser has a question and kind of a quickie but he's he really wants your views on uh initial capital at risk versus unrealized gains and and may, i guess he's just kind of looking to hear your wide view on that my wide view is when we did studies of return to risk at every point in a trend following trade. It's a very interesting uh, study that you would do. And you could do it yourself if you wanted, Michael. You could take every buy signal you've got and say, okay, that is day zero. I am in the position now at this price. My stop is wherever it is. And then you go ahead and you let the trade continue on. And you measure the risk per contract of and the return you, you, go, you calculate ahead and, and use your historical database to figure out what the final result of that trade ultimately is. But then you go back and you go through every day of the trade and figure out what was the potential future return for the rest of that trade versus the risk at, at, at that point in time. So on day five, let's say the trade's going to be at uh, 30 days long and you're going to make 10%. On day five, It's only going to be 25 days to go till you're out of it. And it's only going to have a certain amount of return. It might not be 10%. It might be seven and a half. And then what is the risk at that point? And so we'd measure return to risk every single day throughout the entire trend following trade. And we did this over hundreds and hundreds of trades. And we realized that and concluded without a doubt that the day you get into a trend following trade is the day when your return to risk ratio is the best. The farther you go into the trade, a la the question on pyramiding that someone asked, uh, pyramiding means you're getting in later in the trade and expecting it to continue to go your way. The return to risk ratio is not as good with a pyramid trade. So we pyramided or added positions, but we did them 
in very diminished quantity and under very stringent, low risk conditions where like we'd have a pullback or something and we could move our stop up tight to the market. And we felt comfortable doing that uh, in putting on a very small additional position. That That's a very tricky proposition to try to keep your return to risk ratios high enough to justify doing that. Your initial return to risk ratio is the highest uh, the day you get into the trend following trade. Now, on the ongoing risk, uh, to ask, answer Howard's question there, I always felt because of that nature that trend following uh, a market that has gone in one direction and it favors your position, you're trying to let those profits run. At some point, you have, uh, let's say, five days into the this trade I just described, 10% trade, we're up 3% already. And so it's looking pretty good that this is going to be a profitable trade. It's not, you're already moved ahead nicely and it's going your way and you don't know it's going to be 10%, but it's moving along good so far. So the odds are now greater, it turns out, of having a profitable trade than not having a profitable trade if it moves in your direction. We did that study too. Given that, what we did was we loosened our risk and volatility controls a little bit for an existing trade, and we called that existing controls, and then we had initial limits for the initial position. And the existing trade levels were always a little higher than the initial risk levels and volatility levels. So let's say, use the 1% as an example, say 1% risk of your portfolio and then maybe existing trades, it's 2% risk of your portfolio. So you're giving it some room to grow. And I think you'd also make the point there here. Once again, this is something where people need to not just trust Tom, but exactly. to, to test this, to see how Absolutely. the range of possibilities unfold. Exactly. Because in the end, each trader has to live with his or her own decision. Uh, and I'm not going to be there to console them. So they've got to... They've got to come up with whatever level feels comfortable. I, the, I mean, I, for somebody like my mother who couldn't stand to, to see her account go up or down a penny, she would have to trade at like a, a tenth of 1% risk to keep it so boring. But uh, I think it's everybody's got their own level of comfort, and I think you need to uh, understand what that is. Let's say you're, uh, I don't know, Warren Buffett to cite an example, and he's going to go into trading – 20 commodity markets, and he's only going to put up uh, $1 million to do that. Well, that's going to be such chump change of his total net worth. He might want feel comfortable holding a different risk level because it's immaterial to him even if he loses it all. So, so his comfort level could be a lot different because of his situation. Uh, comfort level also come from expertise. His, his utility, yeah, his utility of money for sure. It's going to be different there at that stage ex- of the game. Exactly, and yeah. his also expertise levels. If somebody's very, very uh, into their systems and understands exactly what they're doing, and is comfortable with drawdowns generated by those strategies because they're so knowledgeable in systems, well, then you could run your risk levels a little higher, perhaps because there's that. Um, technical expertise yeah. that you have over the novice. But the pure novice with no, no experience, no nothing, keep it low. The lower right. you go, just putting a trade on and taking it off, even at a very low level, may not be material to making a lot of money, but it's very material to your experience and your uh, growth as a trader. Yeah. I have one last question, Tom, but I want to make a, a comment overall for people because we were kind of getting into it there a second ago, which is the idea of kind of a, a guru status. I, I, I think Tom... If, if I read you, Tom, you love giving insights about what you've experienced. And mm-hmm. then the idea is that people can extrapolate from that and maybe they can get a little bit of a head start or they can, they can learn from your experience. They can see something, but you know, I don't think Tom is, is, is looking to hold himself out as a guru. I think he's looking to be a man who's sharing his wisdom, sharing his insight, saying, here's my past experiences. And I think the group of questions were pretty good that I, I think most people kind of get that about you, Tom. But there's some questions where you could kind of tell people, you know, they, 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 they want like the magic answer. And if you give them the magic answer, then they're validated. And that's really not what you're trying to get across to people. Is that a fair yep. assessment? Well, it's a fair assessment. The only reason I put the direction that I have on my indicators and my hedges every day on my Facebook page is because I have a brother-in-law and I have a uh, a stepson 
who are trying to uh, muddle through early stages of trading. And I find it convenient to communicate with them uh, in that manner because they do have Facebook pages and they can actually um, find out which way I'm leaning to then ask me questions, which they usually do, and and become more knowledgeable. I'm trying to help my stepson learn how to become a trader and manage his 401k and all that. And so I, do, I, I started doing it just for basically relatives and friends that were asking me the questions. It's dovetailed into this like 300 friends all over the world <laughs> thing uh, that uh, I wasn't quite expecting at the time, but I don't mind carrying on the tradition. Well, I, I, I hope, hopefully I'm responsible for uh, eliminating some of your free time in your life. <laughs> it, it, it seems to me a lot of the new friend requests usually have a Michael Covell as a Imagine a that. friend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here's the last question I have for the day. So this is Jeremy Clifford, and he once again, he's talking about this. Uh, I mentioned David Harding being on uh, CNBC recently, and I guess Harding gave a story about uh, getting long at crude oil at like 30 bucks a barrel. And he said he was, I guess he must have said in the interview, he was a little nervous. I, and But, you know, his system said, get long, you got long. It turned out to be a great trade. And so Jeremy's saying, if, you know, do you have anything that you can think back of where, you know, the, the signal said, you know, get long or get short. And your gut was just like, no way, this is insane. But it's your system. You stuck with it. You did it. And it turned out to be a great winner. Um. Man, that's on the I've spot had, question. <laughs> I, no, 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 I've had those. I'm trying to remember a specific example. One of them, I believe, was the market timing signal that I got to buy mutual funds off of the bottom action after the 87 crash. Uh, I mean, the world was coming to an end. Everybody, I mean, they were flooding liquidity in with the Fed, and, and uh, you know, we'd lost 23% on the Dow in one day, something like that. And uh, mutual funds, fortunately, were in cash about a week or two before the signal went. Well, when the signal went off, it, it was already a week before the crash actually uh, hit. So I preserved all the assets, and now we're getting a buy signal. And I'm thinking to myself, "Boy, is this artificial? We got the Fed coming in. We got super volatility. You know, that's gone off the off the map. But it's a buy signal, and if this thing runs up, we're going to be caught." without a position and it's not what we do so i said it doesn't feel comfortable but you know it turns out if you bought in right after that crash it it did nothing but go up for a, a year or so um it was a good period and you just have to shake your head and go oh boy this would be interesting and but you got to follow the strategy i uh, the people at trendstat had a role with me i said you know as long as you do exactly what these computers tell you to do I'll take the responsibility for the commuters to be doing it correctly, and I'll also take the responsibility for having the strategy produce losses during any period. But you're going to take the responsibility of actually executing it flawlessly. And uh, by separating that out, um, you know, I relieved them of any stress of being wrong on the market direction or anything, and they could execute uh, but yeah, I had a few times over my life that I've had that happen. And it's been surprising how many times when you're most uncomfortable, so are almost everybody else out there. And by the time everybody gets comfortable, the market's already moved significantly in the, in that direction. You got to just, got to just turn your brain off a little bit and do the trade. So Tom, do you have, I know we, you, you, if you want to say, Mike, I'm, I'm, I'm fried, I'm done. Um, but do you have anything that uh, those are the end of the question? So if there's any other thought or wrap up that you might want to go, or we can just uh, pause until the new year and hopefully find you again on the podcast in the new year. Well, uh, it'd be fine. But I think the only thing I think we can encourage people to do out of this is what I try to encourage everybody to do really is to find their own way. Uh, list down what your resources are, what your skill levels are, what your mental capabilities are, uh, how many dollars are you going to put into the thing, what markets are you trying to trade, and figure it out and design what, what works for you. Uh, because what works for you is not going to work for me, and what works for me is not going to work for you. So I get a lot of questions on things, and I'm happy to have the questions. And I'm happy to help when uh, people have issues. Uh, but I would encourage that sort of introspective look at oneself to decide how do I want to trade because I've seen so many successful traders and do it so many different ways. I think it's the key is when you look at what they're doing, it matches what they are. 
and they didn't go out and just follow somebody else. You're probably most happiest when someone who's been asking you questions disappears and finally stops asking you questions. No, I well, I you, I just, like you know what I mean. Though touch. philosophically, yeah. well, philosophically, I think they finally uh, either get it or give up. I don't, I'm not sure which, but uh, if, if they if I don't hear from them again, it's hard to say which yeah, one. Yeah, well, that's that, that fair point. Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, no, I, you know, guys, uh, a lot of times when they're starting out, they'll ask me a lot of questions, or they become a, a friend on Facebook and they'll ask me some questions, and I try to give them you know concise answers on uh, and get them pointed in the right direction, but invariably some of those answers are going to lead them off into you know maybe months of work and so if they're going to go off and do that work great it's going to take months i i probably don't hear from them for a while uh but you know there's there's a lot of guys you've interviewed and listened to some of the podcasts myself uh, it's phenomenal how much effort they put into thinking through their own strategies and they aren't doing what i do they're doing something different um and yet they are successful in their own right. And it matches who they are, what their dollar sizes are. Uh, some of them are working full time. Uh, I mean, Larry, I remember just started up his new car dealership there and uh, has a phenomenal life plan and a great trading strategy. And it's not the same as mine, but he's got a lot of things going for him. Just lots of other guys. Uh, Steve Burns uh, listened to his podcast. And I thought it was great. Um, I, I can't even remember all the names and all the ones I've listened to anymore, but there's a lot of smart people out there and they all have different talents than I have. I mean, there's a lot of people that know a lot more about economics than I know about economics, let's say. So maybe that's useful. Or they may know a lot more about computer programming than I do. I'm an engineer, but I wouldn't call myself a programmer. I can program, but you know, I keep it simple. You know, Tom, I have to fess up. So I think this is like 93, 94 podcast or something. You're not the only person that's having a memory problem with all these podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no. I can't, I can't really admit that, but there is an issue going on here. <laughs> Congratulations on that, by the way, because I think you've hit a wonderful niche where I think you're exceptional at interviewing. And uh, this little game that we've had where we've had everybody ask the questions has just been a blast for me. I hope it's been fun for you too. Yeah, I think we're like, great. Uh, and as long as the person is willing to jump around on topics, because you get kind of far afield sometimes on the next question, yeah, um, I don't mind it. Uh, if it's useful for someone, you know, all the better. But I think it's a fun way to to lay down some recording. And in the digital world, it doesn't cost you that much to put it up there, and it's digitally free to download. And, and you're helping a lot of people out there, and you obviously have a big fan base. So I'm telling you, it's am- it's amazing. These podcasts uh, this this month will probably end up being the largest month, even on a short month, even with Thanksgiving. And I mean, we're just talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of listens. And uh, a lot of these individual episodes are, 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 I mean, it's just thousands and thousands of listens. So it's, it's, it's really fun to watch. And I think it's some, somewhere, I don't like 147 countries and territories. I mean, mm-hmm. Tom, we're never going to get to that many in our life. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I've traveled the world, but I haven't traveled every country and I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I'm gonna let you run. Uh, I appreciate your time today. And we'll get this up uh, later today. Well, it's my pleasure. And uh, good luck to everybody out there. Thanks, Tom. And enjoy the ride. Let me keep that party going. Here is my third podcast episode with Tom Basso. Here's the first question I had for you today, and a bunch of folks on the internet also had some questions too. But I think one of the things that's interesting about you, and I think this is somewhat what you're known for, at least by reputation, but you know, you're very good natured. And there is a lot of people, there are a lot of people in the industry, so to speak, and, and maybe traders where sometimes they lose sight of the happy part of life. They, they just lose sight of life. In fact, they get so fixated with the screen and the idea of making the millions and, and, and what they think will come with all the millions. And they get caught up in that. And you're so good natured. So I guess my first question is, where, when is, is there a reason why Tom Basso is so good natured? I mean, you, you sign a lot of your posts, you know, enjoy the ride, my friends. I mean, it's very good natured. That's, that's, that stands out as unusual in today's society. Yeah, I suppose. I, I guess when I was going through high school, I 
ended up sort of observing my own behavior quite a bit. It was a weird thing where I almost have the second part of my brain that would watch what Tom Basso did every day. I, I kind of, I don't know, it was a weird thing, but it kind of gave me the ability to sort of analyze how did I react to the world around me day after day. And I used to do it pretty much once a day, sort of think through the day and kind of say, did I react well to that situation? Was I overly nervous? Were they overly excited, overly depressed, overly scared, or whatever? And I think as time went on through college and I played a lot of basketball, um, I started noticing, you know, being able to be sort of out of my, my own body. I could, I could almost look at our defense and call out where everybody was supposed to be and could see guys behind me because I, I could, in my mind, keep track of the other five guys, and there's one missing, so he's got to be behind my my vision. And, um, you know, that just stuff like that. And it, as I expanded and I got into the real world, I realized that I sort of took that attitude with life in general. I just got It's sort of like a movie, and I'm just flowing with it. And, uh, you know, trading is one part of my life, but so is hitting golf balls, and so is cooking dinner, and so is eating dinner and so is watching television and you know being a husband to my wife and and all the other things that go on with life and um i don't know to to make trading your whole world seems a bit shallow to me there's so much more to life and it is so short uh you get reminded of that as you get older and i'm 61 now you get start seeing some of your friends pass away and uh, you start realizing you know it's nice to take some time to go to Tahiti like I was telling you I was making arrangements for this morning you know just to enjoy some things that you've never done before and uh, and uh, help other people you know, to me uh, you know I, I only have a finite time on this earth but trading will go on hopefully uh, way past my lifetime and it's nice to pass along this the simple things that I've learned that aren't rocket science science really uh, as you know from your knowledge of trend following it's not that difficult people make it difficult i think and i think if you can help people understand how simple it is and how there's other more to life than just trading i think that's a good thing more balance in the world i'm going to give a shout out to a young guy who i believe you're on his podcast uh, andrew selby yeah. and i caught a line that as i was preparing to talk to you today i caught a line where you talked about the idea of imagining and I'm paraphrasing, so I'll let you tell it incomplete, but imagining the horror, even if it doesn't happen, imagine feeling it. And when I saw you say that, or I saw the comment, I thought to myself, stoicism. Was was I on the right path? Yeah, I think what you're trying to, you're trying, is this, was this a reference to how to prepare for things? Right, you kind of got to go through like mental exercises and whatnot, yeah. and you were talking about the imagining, and I, my first thought when I saw it, because I always think of stoicism, is like, you know, think of, think through the worst case scenarios, live them, live them in your mind, and then when some of these bad things happen, you're not so surprised. Well, that's exactly right, but I'd also argue that you should also live through the uh, good times as well in your mind. So, when you're getting into a position, if you could say, if this went insane, like if tomorrow or something, this stock I just bought gets get, gets an offer for twice the value that I just put into it, what does that mean? How do I react? Am I overly excited, adrenalized? Do I want to take the profit? Do I want to, you know, or am I just going to follow my strategy and just do what I do? And I think you got to prepare yourself for all sides of it, not just the bad ones, but the good ones too. I think you have to think ahead go through a lot of different scenarios and, and be prepared mentally to deal with them. That's kind of the, the trend following in, in the emotional arena as well. Yeah, it really is. It really is. T tell me about some of – is because since we kind of started going down the psych side of things, so to speak, the mental side, tell me some about your mental exercises, so to speak. And I'm assuming – the mental exercises that you, whether you're driving in the car or whatnot, th that these are for far more than just trading. Yeah, I uh, played all sorts of games on myself over my lifetime uh, with my brain, and I think that it uh, reaps some good rewards. Uh, I've already mentioned the sort of observer self that I had in high school and in through college. As as I observed myself doing things, I think eventually somewhere probably after college, I would say, this observer part of my brain 
you know, that just I kind of had a certain part of my brain dedicated to kind of keeping track of what Tom was doing every day. That sort of meshed right into my brain, sort of. You know, if you, if it, it became such a natural thing for it to be there. I don't even think about it. I don't see it as a separate entity or part of my brain that would de- dedicate itself to watching Tom do his day. I think all sorts of exercises can... You can play games with minds, for instance. Uh, I, th- I remember Van Tharp saying that young children that were about ready to, young boys mostly, that would go out and fight their first tiger or try to hunt their first lion, would be taught to defocus their eye state and see what it does to your brain. And because it, it sort of takes away a lot of your fear. And I've tried doing that on the golf course to some success, where you walking down a fairway, you look at a distant object, but then after you're focusing your eye on the distant object like the pin, you try to see your peripheral vision clearly as well so that the whole thing becomes just, you know, this monster view going into your brain and you're not focused on any one thing like that lake over to the right that your ball could go into if you hit it poorly. It's just this one big vision and fear goes away. Um, lots of different things. Uh, breathing, uh, noticing that you're breathing heavy or you're talking faster or you're moving faster or those types of things all just being an observant i think is is a lot of it um driving i've uh (laughs) i've I've played games with just uh wondering how these guys get off the drag race you know when the light goes green so i'll be sitting there and i'm watching everybody else who's playing with their uh, texting and listening to the radio and, and doing everything. And I'm sitting there in the first position at a, at an intersection, of course, being careful to look both ways, making sure nobody's coming at me, you know, trying to see what would be the, the qu- quickest possible reaction time that my body can take my foot off the brake and put it on the gas. Not to go fast, but just to be the first car moving into the intersection, leaving the rest of them uh, still wondering what's going on. Just little things like that. I think it's all been fascinating learning how the human body works and how the brain works. And I think even though we can't get into the minutia of all these different types of things in this conversation, if anything, you can inspire people in the audience that are younger, maybe they're starting out, or maybe they've gone the wrong directions. You can inspire people to start to think more about this this mental aspect of success. Because if you don't have mental capability and, and good psychology and trading, the rest of everything you'll do will be destroyed. You, you can always, you can have the, the most fantastic, I could, I could automate a program, put it in a black box, hand it to somebody who is a basket case mentally, and they will screw it up because they have the ultimate ability to, you know, the, the person that doesn't have good control of their mind is going to have a problem even executing a well-constructed black box because they will screw it up. They will override it. They will not do a trade that they should have done. They'll take profits too quick because they finally feel like they've got all this profit built up and they don't want to wait for their stop signal to get hit. They'll never do it. I think as soon as people realize that the mental side of trading is the first and foremost and then Next up probably is going to be your uh, position sizing, uh, control of your risk, volatility, all those issues on the portfolio. And last and least important is going to be what you buy and sell or where do you buy and sell, basically. You know, on the emotional side, as you're bringing that up, you're not just necessarily pointing out to, let's say, new traders or inexperienced traders. There are plenty of super successful not necessarily sure how they got there, but plenty of super successful maybe people, maybe they had a little luck, very wealthy people mm-hmm. that make those mental errors that you're talking about, and, and a life's fortune can go down very fast. It certainly has, and, and if you look at, say, the first Market Wizards book and even the second one, you'll see certain people in there that are no longer around because they were... They might have done well up to then, but they were pushing the envelope, and maybe they didn't have their mental processes screwed on as straight as uh, they would have liked and uh, have, you know, went awry along the way. I survived 28 to 30 years roughly trading, if you want to count now, it's another 10 years, uh, trading currencies with no issues uh, blowing up or I'm still doing it. I mean, it's a long run and you got a lot of traders don't make it that long. And I think a lot of it's due to how they uh, think through the process and how much risk they want to take on and how much 
they can stay with something day after day after day after day. I've always been pretty calm towards the whole thing, and I think that's reflected in maybe, I mean, some people have accused me of being a little bit on the boring side uh, in terms of trading. I'd never went for the fancy profits or anything, the big profits. But I like to try to avoid the losses and continue to plug along, and I think that it serves you well over the long run. A lot of people could take a, a good lesson from that. You're one of my most popular guests, if not the most popular. So your boring must be pretty exciting to a lot of people. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. That's the, that's my my impression. Yeah, so every, me, every time we do one of these interviews, I get about fifteen emails or Facebook uh, <laughs> letters. Well, let me jump into some trading issues. I had a couple points that people brought up and a couple things of my own. I saw a line. I just want to read it to you and tell me what you think about it. So the quote was this. If you're not afraid of losing small amounts of money, you're almost invincible. Yeah, How does that, that, sh- that strike you? It strikes me pretty well because uh, that would allow you to realize on things like trend following where if you do the statistics on what we did at Trendset back over the years, various buy-sell programs that we would have would range from perhaps 28% reliable all the way up to maybe... The, the top I would ever get would be 40, but you know, more realistically, 36, 37% reliable. So it's averaging around 33% or one third, let's say. That means every single trade I get into, I've got a two thirds chance of losing money. So if I take that on mentally and say, okay, I want to make that those two losses that I statistically know I'm going to get, I've got thousands of data points to tell me that I'm going to get two losses for every one game. I might as well take the, the attitude that i got to limit those two losses and be okay with it because that's just two out of three that i got to look for. For every three trades I do, I'll get a profit. Profit will be bigger than the losses. I make money over the long run. It's, that's what we're doing here. you know. So why would I be concerned over those small losses? And I think once you realize that and accept it and understand why you got to have those two losses, uh, then I think you're well on the way to, to making some good money. Uh, I, I heard one person say one time, a long time ago, trading is sort of like breathing. You got to, uh, you know, everybody wants to breathe in because you get oxygen, but you have to breathe out also. <laughs> and that's kind of like the losses. They're both part of the breathing process. You got to have in and out. Yeah, I tell you, as, as I continue my yoga practice, the, the breathing is. It's the core. It's the core of it all. Well, let me shift in here to another one. So I did an interview today and someone asked me a question. I'm going to give it back to you. Okay. And they wanted to know why trend following does so well when the black swans hit. And so I was curious, curious as to, to your, if somebody asked you that, well, you know, Tom, why, why does trend following do, do, why does it do so well when the black swan events happen? These surprises happen. Well, trend following by its very math is saying let your profits run as far as they want to run and cut your losses short when they don't go your way. If a black swan happens, which is a outlier event of major consequence probably that has never happened before and it's gone like way beyond the realms of anything anybody's ever seen, trend following at some point is going to pick up the move in that direction. It may be a big gap to get into it. It may have started out months ago uh, as nothing, and then all of a sudden has become a speculative bubble at this point. Every one will happen a different way, and I've probably seen them all in my lifetime. But no matter where you do get in, you will get in, and you will ride part of that black swan. And that one trade, and maybe a couple of others, might be the difference between making money that year and losing money that year when you take everything else and add it together. Because your small gains are going to offset some of your small losses. But to really make money, you need those those kind of real outlier events that really drive you know, a, a Japanese yen position and you're in it for the whole year or year and a half and the thing has gone up 100% on the, uh, on the face value of the currency and you're leveraged and you end up making you know, hundreds or thousands of percent. That really pays the freight for a whole lot of losses. And that's why trend following makes money. Let's talk about your daily routine and going back a long time. And I caught a post the other day on your Facebook where you were talking about 
the total amount of time that it took to execute <laughs> your da- your daily routine. And I want you to actually talk about routine some because I have a feeling routine is very important in your life. And there's a reason why routine is very important. Um, but and I want you to explain the, the time that it takes for you, but then to also interject. Of course, you have to develop the system. Um, and there's a lot of time behind that. But then once you have your system and your, your daily execution, why don't I let you run with that and explain what you had posted the other day? Okay, let's talk about the two things. First, the, the thing on time. Uh, the other day I posted something, and I think it took me 12 minutes after the markets closed to go through my entire process. And I forget exactly the numbers, but I want to say I moved like four stops in one uh, in the stock area times four accounts. I think I moved uh, one or two futures trades. I can't remember how many. Um, I also checked and moved some stops on my hedge trades, and it all took me 12 minutes. And I did that because I was getting some posts and questions from traders on, well, on, on how much they need to do and how often do they need to look at the market. And you know, I, I was getting the reaction that some of these people were spending their entire day looking at the screen. And I'm thinking to myself, what could I possibly do to waste that much time? And so I thought I was going to try to just go ahead and time myself just to make the point to everybody out there that, sure, I, if you want to argue about it, I, I, I've got 28 years at Trendstat, another 10 years retired honing my skills and hold on that's not even 40 years yet that's only like 38 years it's only 38 years <laughs> i'm still only 61 uh but you know when you get that much experience behind your belt you know what you got to do every day you just have to kind of execute it and i think if you're trying to design a new way of trading every single day and every single moment looking at the screen and looking looking at the price going up and down and trying to say well what this is does this tell me should i change my strategy should I do some research on this new idea that I just heard uh, in a, a podcast or a newsletter or wherever I got it from, a friend? You're going through all this gyration in your mind. That is going to just gobble up time, and it's so nonproductive. And in my case, I know exactly what I've got to do to execute my trend-following models. And I pull up my screens, and I start at the top, and I start going click, 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 click. And then my mouse is, of course, I'm faster and faster over the years with my mouse and uh, my computers and I know exactly what I got to do next and I just keep going. I try to tell my wife just kind of I'm going to be closing the market down I tell her and she knows to just kind of stay away from the office for a little bit. And 12 minutes later I was done, stopped the clock and I went and did the Facebook post. So that's kind of where the time thing came from but routine you mentioned and I would say routine is important uh, and I, I guess I kind of you know, I, I guess I got kind of the routine side of things from the standpoint of the markets will wait for no one is one of the things I've always told my staff at Trendset back in the day. And that's why we had so many backups and so many somebody's taking a vacation, somebody else has to fill their spot. At, the markets won't shut down because you're having a 4th of July because guess what? London does not respect the U.S.'s 4th of July. We've revolted from them. So the currency markets are open on the 4th of July. We got to be there. We got to still do our thing. Who's going to take a vacation day? Who's going to work? Routine becomes something that is driven sort of by the way the, the markets and really almost life work. Uh, you know, you, you probably get up. You'd probably be good to have breakfast in the morning because it fuels your body for the rest of the day. Uh, it's probably good to exercise. I see you upside down sideways on your yoke <laughs> positions, and uh, you're obviously in good shape. I could not do that; wouldn't even try. The uh, you know, stay, I do work out. I am in good shape for a 61 year old, I think, and uh, still hitting the ball pretty well. And I'm in, I'm enjoying all these things. But I think that routine of exercising, routine of eating, routine of hydrating your body with water, routine of making sure you're there for the markets. I've got to put my stops in and move my stops or check things once a day. So on this cruise to Tahiti, for instance, that we were talking about earlier, I am now up to a level with this cruise line where they give me unlimited internet on the concierge level, which is where I'm going to be. So I'm bringing along the computer, and sometime each day after the markets close in Tahiti, I will be on my computer for my 12 minutes. Then I will go back to having fun. But there's a certain routine that has to be done there. And I think that's kind of the way, uh, some people think that's too rigid, but I, 
I mean, I can spare 12 minutes on a vacation. I don't think of that as too burdensome. No, and especially the life freedom that you get from making the choices that you've made. What's it, you know, some people think, oh, I'm going to go on vacation. I don't want any distraction. But those are the same people that go back and work a nine to five, uh, you know, grind working for the boss man their entire life. So I agree with you completely. Or they go back home and they find that they've missed all sorts of signals that they should have missed uh, or should have gotten. Uh, I'm remembering the story I told Schwager back when I was, he was doing New Market Wizards interview with me uh, about the silver trade that my parents were visiting me and I had missed the silver trade and it turns out it was worth like $100,000 and this was when my account was $10,000 yeah. um, and I had missed it and it, when I when I missed it because I wasn't paying attention to my stuff I was playing tour guide to my parents I'm not blaming my parents it's my responsibility I should have been doing that shouldn't have been taking my 12 minutes or whatever it was that back then to do my work and I got sloppy missed the trade missed that profit that would have been uh, you know put me way ahead of where I ended up being uh, now. I would have been that much farther ahead at an earlier stage and been profitable more early in my trading. So it's all, you have to really look at how you go through every day and ask yourself, where's the time slip away? Because you, have, you wake up in the morning and go to sleep at night, and there's a lot of minutes in between. And if you really think about what you spend them on, it's kind of uh, amazing how many you can waste. And in this day and age, we, we waste a lot more with all these electronic gadgets, for sure. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is a question from Fred Penny. And Fred had a, I thought it was a good question. He, uh, he said, you know, if, if you were a 20-something guy or gal today and not much, not much money and you're just getting new knowledge, if you were looking back and you, with your experience and saying today, and you were approaching the kind of the trading world today, would you, would you approach things the same way? Would you go about it the same way? I don't think so. Uh, I ended up, of course, as most people know, a money manager and a futures trader and a currency trader. And Trendstat Capital was my firm before we shut it down back in 2003. Back in the day when I started, which would be back in the, I was starting a trade in the 70s, really got our first firm off the ground in 1980. I formed Trendstat in 84, um, broke away from the previous firm, Kennedy Capital, and ended up at Trendstat. When I did all these things, track record, if you could just establish that you were trading even $100,000 and doing it successfully over a period of, say, one, two, three years, and maybe showed growth in assets from 100000 maybe to a half a million, maybe you got a million now under management, people would take a serious look at you and say, this guy's making progress, his track record looks solid, I like his approach, he seems sensible, He's in the, he seems like a smart businessman, he's going to... He's hiring people to back him up. He's got computer equipment. Yeah, we'll give him a chance. Here's another $5 million. And all of a sudden, the, you got $10 million under management. And all of a sudden, somebody will give you another $10 million, And pretty soon, you're at twenty, And then you're off to the races. And you can build your business that way. Nowadays, I get the perception, and I'm a little bit removed from the industry these days, being retired. But I've heard stories where some... Uh, asset allocators would want you to have you know 20 or 50 million under management and have a staff of 10 people and computer equipment and backup locations and marketing staff and everything else and i don't know how i would have ever gotten into the business back in the day so i think in today's world with all the automation and with all the uh, i mean basically i use uh, schwab and interactive brokers for the two sides of my trading in a lot of my stuff, and I use them all around the world. I'm in Italy or Tahiti or any place. I get an internet connection, and I'm boom, I'm in. No big deal. A lot of the, the charting software and all that stuff, we had to build that at Trendstat in the old days. Nowadays, it's free uh, with your account, and it just keeps getting more and more sophisticated. I'd be inclined to go ahead and work a, as you said before, a 9-to-5 job of some sort, and perhaps one that had a little bit of flexibility to it so that I could do some trading as I was working the job. I mean, when I was an engineer, a chemical engineer, I could easily go home at 4.30 from designing chemical plants and spend a half an hour working on my commodity account and transmit my orders and go have dinner. It wasn't a big deal. So your, your real issue, your real issue is, if I'm, if I'm hearing you, is, is yeah. more that it's the money management versus the trading and they're not one and the same. No, they are not. And for those people who think they're going to get in the money management industry, uh, let me tell you that the year before I shut Trendset down, I spent a hundred grand on regulatory uh, CPA and legal fees uh, at no benefit to my client that I could see, 
and I spent probably 60% of my time either with personnel, accounting, or legal issues. Less than 10% of my time probably actually doing meaningful research or trading that most people would think is the fun thing that they like to do. You spend very little time trading, more time running a business if you want to be successful at it. And I think that, I think for most people, if they love trading, I would suggest staying a little longer. If it was me right now, I probably would have stayed an engineer or uh, moved into the business side of my company that I was at. I probably would have done a little more strategic planning and business things and tried to get, you know, I was highly rated at this company I was at. And they would, they, I was promoted a month before I quit. They seemed to like what I was giving them and doing. Uh, I would just get more raises there, uh, get into stock options, get into whatever you can get into, and keep saving a lot of that money, put it into your trading accounts, hone your skills at smaller amounts of money, and then get your portfolio to the point where it was supplying an, an extra source of income for you. And when that extra source of income got to the point where it was equal to your current source of income, you probably could safely retire at that point. And I probably would would guess that um, uh, rather than retiring at 51, if had I done that, I might have been able to retire even before uh, because the things that I did at Trendstat kind of by their nature uh, had to be very regulatory. So, for instance, I couldn't front run or do anything. You know, I had to be careful with what positions I have versus the clients and all these things. And so basically I had to kind of keep everything pretty plain vanilla with my own trading sort of match my clients or actually put my money in the same fund that my clients are in so that I'm getting exactly the same trades in essence so that there would be no uh, favoritism uh, to me over the clients because that's illegal. And I think without those restrictions, what I'm finding after 10 years of retirement is I can do things that I could never do for clients. I, I trade orange juice futures. Jeez, I, can, I only need one of them or two of them for my portfolio. If I had trends set with $600 million under management, how am I going to buy orange juice futures? I, I might be able to buy 10 or 20 of them, but uh, that's not going to mean anything to my clients. So it's, it's a whole different world when you're trading for yourself. You know, you mentioned the regulatory environment, and I, I think it's worth pointing out that, and I'm not purporting to be a regulatory expert, but and I'm also not taking a shot at our home country, but mm. it probably is worth investigating for those of those, for those folks listening that not all regulatory climates are the same and not all home countries are the same. So there might be some situations that are, uh, a little less, uh, strident than, than others. And I'm not saying that in, in yeah. a way that they're less strident than that means it's, you know, cowboy and no regulation. I'm just saying that there are some places where it's gotten a little tougher than others. Yeah, and there's some places that uh, that are easier, uh, some places that are actually worse than the U.S. probably, um, sure, sure. in some ways, uh, very, very ancient thinking on in certain things, and some states in the U.S. that are worse than other states. Uh, Wisconsin comes to mind as a uh, state that seems to have extremely uh, stringent restrictions on mutual funds and things like that. They seem to always have had a tough time getting uh, people to, to uh, blue sky their stuff. Uh, worth inve worth investigating though for those folks listening. Don't don't make assumptions that everything no. in all climates are the same and all countries are the same. And sadly, some of the friends I have on Facebook that are foreign based, uh, they're in Australia or they're in other you know Vietnam or someplace. They realize, as I did, that a lot of the assets uh, that you can obtain to manage seem to be in the U.S. Uh, we are a very wealthy country, and there are a lot of assets, a lot of pension plans, and things that need to be managed here. Uh, when I got into the currency business, it got a little bit better because there was less regulation on currency trading. And there was banks like Royal Bank of Canada, Bank of Montreal, uh, Soc Gen over in France, other places that I had as clients that were, uh, uh, you know, where I didn't have the regulation and, and they weren't in the U.S. and having to deal with U.S. stuff either. Uh, so I had some U.S. banks as clients. I had some foreign banks as clients. It was kind of an interesting mix. And it, it, Different environments are definitely need to be explored because how you run a business is all going to be about what you're allowed to do because between the government and your clients restricting the money manager and what he or she is able to do day to day managing the portfolio, that's going to dict dictate some of your success. Uh, yeah. If your clients and regulation don't let you buy orange juice futures, then you can't buy orange. That's it can't be part of your portfolio. You know. Yeah. Uh, it's just a simple fact. So that does affect your returns. You have to all think about that. 
Let me shift gears on you. I love shifting gears on you. Just, just, it's, <laughs> <laughs> why not? Right. Um, I, why so not? I, I love it. I, that's why I like your interviews. I never know where they're going. <laughs> it's yeah, my brain's not a straight line. Um, so, uh, Clint Stevens, uh, I think, you know, Clint, and yeah, Clint, I know Clint, 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 uh, it's kind of a combination question here, but he kind of wanted to know, do you tinker with your current systems and kind of adding into that? How do you know when you're dealing with a normal drawdown versus like, uh oh, this system is shot? So, you know, do you still tinker and how do you know when, when something has really gone the wrong way? Okay. First one, uh, do I tinker? I'm currently in my futures trading using the same buy and sell triggers that I think I created and probably were using back in about 1984. How ancient? How archaic? And they're they can't, be, they can't be useful. They can't be good anymore, Tom. They've got to be. They're, 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 they've got to be retire those. No, they're virtually identical. I used to sit down, and the only difference is I used to do it all on graph paper, and now I have computers that are sitting there, and I'm looking at fancy colors and all sorts of data that I didn't have available. Uh, so it's a little easier. Because so it's the graph, the graph that, paper would take you from 12 minutes to 30 minutes? Yeah, yeah. I used to, ta- I used to take about an hour doing my futures okay. portfolio. I, I, but my goal over my lifetime was actually to put myself out of work um, so that I could have more time to golf and do other things. So, so you, don't, you don't tinker. Okay, that one's off. What yeah, about what not about much, No. I, but that being said, uh, let's say I come up with um, – Well, uh, for a good example, uh, ETFs uh, never were around. Back in the day, I traded mutual funds. So we'd look for no-load mutual funds, and we'd have to do end-of-day buy and sell uh, because that's the nature of a mutual fund. When when ETFs, uh, exchange-traded funds, that is, came into being and started trading continuously throughout the day, then you could start thinking about stuff like stop orders and and you could do things that were were, uh, might get executed intraday even if you were not executing them the stops would be executed intraday and it uh it to me it, it minimized the risk of the overnight gap type of situation a little bit more uh and therefore was a good thing to start looking to add to my portfolio so i wouldn't call that necessarily tweaking as much as looking at various new products that might come into the portfolio and i might have to do something a little different to actually try to physically trade those. But the, the ones that I've had in the past, I don't tweak too much now. And on the uh, other question you had on... If, it's, if, it's, if, the, drawdown, if the drawdown starts to be a little steep, do you, or how do you I know t- when things I tell are- you what I, I do there, uh, and this is the scenario analysis we were talking about earlier a little bit. If you know you've got a strategy and you've thought through, okay, if this thing goes well, and I have these types of market conditions. This is what's going to happen good. This is what's going to happen if it goes really to crap. And this is what's going to happen if we just kind of have an expected, you know, month or six months. If you've really thought and done a good job of that, then you should ask yourself on a drawdown. Look at the markets you're trading. Look at your portfolio. Look at the market action that has been provided to you by the market. You had nothing to do with that. That was just the universe sending you ups and downs and all over the places. And ask yourself, given those conditions, would you have expected anything different than what you're seeing? If the answer is yes, then I would say, then something's wrong with your strategy and you need to do some tweaking and need to do some homework and work and research and whatever to find out what's the difference between what you would have expected versus what actually happened. But if you ask or answer that same question, you know, this is a, an extraordinarily choppy period and there's been some violent disruptions that, you know, I would get caught in with this strategy and I would expect to have a drawdown, then it's not broken, don't fix it. Straightforward. Straightforward. That's, that's kind of how I look at it. Jim Byers has a question, and Jim was curious if you are a one-system guy or multiple systems. Multiple. When we were at Trendstat and running our flagship fund, the the market math last year before I closed everything down, uh, we had six different portfolios within the fund that ranged from trading commodity options to two different approaches in currencies, two different approaches in futures, and one approach to mutual fund timing. Uh, And I think within 
the mutual fund timing even there was two different sub pieces to that and in one of the futures areas there's probably a couple sub pieces there so there was a lot of interesting stuff going on there and, and all those maths were trend following in a way but they were all very different in how they took on what they took on so they ultimately got they all got to trend following but you had thought through different ways of getting there mm -hmm. based on the markets based on what i was trying to accomplish based on how much risk that particular portfolio was trying to take on some of the strategies we had uh, the, particularly the ones that were more 28 percent reliable uh, because they're 28 percent reliable the math would say you got to have a bigger gain when you have a gain the losses could be bigger as well but you got more losses that you're going to take as a percentage of the total so you got to have a real big one hit and so that was one where we slightly added to positions in a conservative way and when, when risk would allow and we would uh, try to really maximize those particular trades each year that came along that were really really the, you know, paid the way other strategies were more you know just catch every intermediate move up and down and don't worry about the big one we'll be there for it if we get whips out along the way so what the big guy next door will pick up the big gain and not get whips on and so we'd, we'd have different kind of uh personalities to these trading strategies and some clients would pick and choose and say i like that i don't like that uh, if you got in market math then it was my decision as to how it was all allocated and we did a lot of research on that and how much exposure we wanted to each of the strategies and then we rebalanced that uh, monthly back to the uh the set point so that uh kind of the Robin Hood approach of taking from the uh, wealthy strategy and giving it to the uh, poor strategy. So whatever was in a drawdown was being fed, and whatever was on a explosive up move and equity was coming in like crazy, we're taking money off of the table. And that stabilized everything and uh, kind of kept us with a nice steady performance. I think you've got some great wisdom and you've got some great perspective and you've had a very long business career starting as a young man. And so we're in an interesting climate, so to speak, oh, an interesting economic climate. And everybody can hear the political debates, regardless of the side of the fence you're on, the debates are out there. Some folks want more government, some folks want less government. I know where you fall on the spectrum. We probably have very, very similar views. Mm -hmm. I'm not really looking to kind of go down the, you know, the, the blame game or the names game, but I would really just like for you maybe to paint a picture from your perspective, watching markets evolve, watching governments evolve, and especially watching the Fed's involvement, and maybe paint a case for people that don't have your uh, lens, your time horizon lens, paint a picture for people about how you see what's going on today in terms of, let's just keep it very narrow, Fed action. It seems it seems like to me we're, at, we're in brave new territory. Are we, or is it just some of the same that we've seen over the decades? Well, I might back up from just the Fed thing to even a little bit, something just slightly bigger than that, in that society in general these days seems to be gravitating down, and certainly Fed is doing the same thing along this line of not taking responsibility for themselves. It's really, you've taken the responsibility, for instance, to go to Vietnam, to go to Asia, and to, to do your speaking, to bootstrap a business out of your podcasts and, and to be successful. I think... That took a lot of work and a lot of courage and a lot of things. And I think the average person, when they, you know, they're in front of the television every night and, and they can get a government stipend of some sort or, uh, you know, maybe can get an unemployment benefit and not have to go out and look for a job tomorrow or if it's kind of cold tomorrow. I think I'll stay in. I think they're subtly second by second, minute by minute. And with respect to the Fed, the same thing. You know, there's this tendency to think that government, the Fed, and the big entities are going to take care of all these little individuals. And the individuals kind of allow them to do that, strangely, because it's, it's the easy way to go rather than the difficult way that you've gone or that I've gone. It's easy to not take re responsibility. It's easy to say somebody else is to fault for the way that my little life is today i think the fed is sitting there saying okay well we got a, an economy that's being overburdened by a government that's spending more than it takes in we got 
what, 17 trillion in actual debt. We got 100 trillion in unfunded liabilities. That adds up to about 117 trillion. The GDP of the country is only about 15, 16 trillion a year. So that's multiple years of total 100% GDP to have you get to close to this, this huge number of liability that we have. That's not a good recipe for success. I don't care. How, I, don't, I can't imagine any economist could put a good spin on that, although the Keynesians seem to try. But the reality of it is, is uh, Fed is just saying, what other choice do we have, kind of? Uh, if, the, if the stock market were to crash, if uh, commodities start skyrocketing, if we have unabated inflation or if we have a depression or whatever, it's going to spill over to the entire world. It could get really rough, and then there's going to be riots in the streets, and there's going to be all sorts of problems. And I hate to be negative, so you try to look at the positive side of that, and they try to say, okay, well, let's let's see if we can keep you know funding enough money into this thing to keep it you know muddling along somehow. You know, over time, maybe somebody brilliantly figures out a way out of the mess. It's looking pretty dim dismal, I think, over the long run in that. I don't think the Fed, the Fed has used so many different tools so far, and I think they're sort of running out of quivers in their, their arrows in the quiver, so to speak. Uh, they've kind of used them, and I don't know what, uh, what they're going to be able to do going forward if things get tough. So uh, I would remain very cautious towards your trading, and I would also look at, like you have, at other countries and diversify internationally if you can. and. Uh, do what you can to protect yourself. So, because I think times could get a little interesting going forward. Well, I think what's interesting about what you say too is, and I saved that question for last because I wanted to establish in our conversation that you're a price based trend follower and that you are going to, your trading is going to respond to whatever activity is happening in the markets, either up or down. To place the view that you just had, the public policy view that you just put out there. That's just your learned view about mm -hmm. the proper way society should go. But mm -hmm. your trading is going to, you know, you're going to do well whichever way the markets go. And I, and I think sometimes people get a little lost in that. They might say, well, what is, why does Tom Basso have, have this opinion? Or why does Mike Covell have this opinion about the markets? Who cares? And my, my report is, you know, it's gotten so unusual if you don't have, a public policy view, regardless of what your trading is, I start to wonder what's wrong with you. Not you, Tom, but you know, if you, if, if this has gotten so unusual out there that if you don't have a view, it kind of scares me. <laughs> well, and it also it goes back to what I think I did in the Andrew uh, interview uh, that you probably listened to about one of the most profound things that happened to me along the way was this ability to listen to someone talking and separate fact from opinion and flag them in my brain. So when you're mm -hmm. reading, a Wall Street Journal uh, article that some analyst is saying, I think this, and the market's going to be here, and that's my prediction, and you just kind of flag it and say, okay, that's interesting, but it's just an opinion. And when Tom says something or Michael says something, same thing. Uh, however, if I say the market closed at 183.76 today or whatever it is, whatever number it is, that is an actual data point. That's a fact. That's not my opinion. It, it is just a number. I think once you start separating facts and data from people's opinions, the whole world of trading gets a whole lot clearer because in my mind, I could think the world's going to come to end, you know, to, to hell in the next year and I could still be long the market. I really don't have any other choice. I mean, where else are you going to put your money and, and where else are you going to try to hold on to some value with the Fed? sort of devaluating the dollar by pumping so much money into the system, you're probably going to end up having to make tens and 20% returns just to try to even hold your uh, hold yourself even uh, in terms of purchasing power. That's a pretty daunting task. Yeah, so. it is. It, it, strange days indeed. But I, yeah. I think I, I love hearing your wisdom, and I know the audience does too, and I, mm -hmm. I appreciate you taking the time today from, from Arizona. Lovely uh, Arizona, sunny and 68 today. Well... I'm jealous. It was like five degrees here the other day. <laughs> hey, Tom, listen, All for right. people, if they want to, if they want to catch up with you, they'll have to find you on Facebook. You're not trying to advertise anything or promote anything. I know no, that. No, I'm retired happily. Yeah. 
And, so uh, if, if they're not if, advertising anything, <laughs> if they could, if they can find you, that's the challenge. If you want to find Tom, you have to find him. I'm not telling you where he is. <laughs> <laughs> so I think spell T O M. I think uh, <laughs> they'll find you. Yeah. Hey, listen, Tom, I appreciate it. And hopefully we can talk again in the new year. Once I'm uh, in another continent. Uh, no problem, Michael. I enjoyed it. Uh, you're welcome as usual. Thank you, sir. And finally, my most recent podcast episode with trend following trader, Tom Basso. I hope you enjoy. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Just got back from two weeks in French Polynesia and very relaxed. Uh, I'm taking a break from moving five tons of gravel in my yard right now to talk to you, and then I'll go back to that when we're done. The five tons of gravel sounds like good exercise, to say the least. That's the way I view it. Yeah. So French Polynesia, I've not been there, even though I've been in roughly that same part of the world. But that's probably, I'm guessing, if I looked at a map, that's probably another 10 hours from where I've been in Southeast Asia. About, yes. It's in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, just off, kind of down by New Zealand area. It's yeah. pretty far south. And uh, although very, you know, in their summertime right now, so 80s, humid, probably a lot like Vietnam and some other places in the summer. Could you live in a place like that? Not if I had my choices, but yeah, I could live there if I had to. But I, I really enjoy Arizona a lot. It has the best of, it seems to me, the mountains and some of the uh, peace and quiet and the beautiful trees. And then it's got the desert down in the valley with Phoenix area where there's a lot of action, lots of concerts and plays and restaurants and things to do. They're only 90 minutes away from each other. So I sort of have the best of both worlds. You know, I have to give you and Jack Schwager and Charles Faulkner all a big shout out because my podcast keeps evolving and changing and I've had a lot of non-trading guests on and some fairly noteworthy. But I think the three of you guys coming on really early and kind of giving me some credibility has really helped to expand things out. So I'm, I'm most appreciative for you sticking Thanks. with me, Tom. I always have fun talking to you. Uh, I, I spend zero time preparing for it, and it's just out. It's just a hole in my schedule, and it's always fun. Listen, here's where I want to go. I thought there was something fairly topical we could talk about. I don't know how you want to set it up or how we should play with it, but I've seen in the headlines there's been some hedge funds that have had not the greatest returns this year, and a lot of people are bemoaning the price of oil, which is kind of funny. You would think oil drops, everyone should be happy, but apparently there's so many budgets and programs and social programs tied to high oil around the world, and so a lot of people aren't happy, but hey, this is a zero-sum game, so quite a few people that in our little world are happy that oil has dropped, but I think what's so interesting is how many people, and I haven't tried to Google this, but how many people... You know, five, six, seven months ago, we're, we're talking about a 50% crater in oil. Uh, you just nobody was predicting this at all. But then there's one trading strategy that seemed to do exceptionally well during this unpredictable run, huh? Yeah, trend following. You know, all you have to do is uh, short it someplace up around 100 or 90 and, and enjoy the ride. Yeah, but you, you make it sound so simple. I mean, there's, it, it, there's some very, I, I saw the head of OPEC and he, he said, well, all the speculators are doing this. And hold on. At what price are the speculators not involved in oil? They're, they're involved at every single price. The reason the speculators are in there <clears throat> helps to create a price without the speculators there and the constant buying and selling. You wouldn't know where the price of oil is from second to second. Uh, you might know where it was from maybe day to day or maybe even hour to hour as big, large companies and large hedgers and things uh, made a transaction. But the market would be very inefficient. It would jump all over the place. With speculators there, you have uh, every second trades going off and you know exactly where the price of oil is second by second. And Tom, I know you personally don't ponder these things so much because you You've been there, done that. You understand it deep in your gut. But when you you hear a headline where the the head of OPEC is saying that the the price is where it should not be, the fundamentals do not support this price, and and cast blame at speculators for this particular point of price. Explain to the audience just how disingenuous that is. Well, it's disingenuous because the price of anything is where someone will buy and sell it to each other at if. 
a speculator would be selling it and driving the price down, someone else has to be buying it to make that transaction happen. And for that person to be buying it, that could also be a speculator. So, well, wait a second, how can speculators be driving it down if speculators are on both sides of that trade? Or it could have been a hedger, like uh, let's say Southwest Airlines uh, in the past has come in and bought gas when they thought it was cheap, and maybe they're thinking that now, so maybe the speculator is selling it to Southwest Air, and they're hedging their future uh, fuel costs. All right, fine. Well, then it goes down cheaper. Well, Southwest can buy some more future cheap oil. I don't see... You know, nobody ever complains uh, like OPEC when the prices go skyrocketing up to 100 and something, but the same speculators are there at that point in time as they are right now. It doesn't, like, it, speculators don't just short the market. They they go both ways. And so it's it's just very, um, it's for public relations. It's trying to place blame. It's trying to placate their people because Saudi Arabia depends so much, as does Norway and uh, there's a trend, yeah, Norway, I think it is. That some of the socialistic type of programs out there in the countries that depend on oil. I think Brazil, to some extent, Venezuela, all countries that are leaning towards liberal socialist types of things and using oil revenues to try to help pay for them. Well, now they don't have those revenues anymore to the level that they used to. So you know, they try to place blame, try to you know not point the finger at themselves for setting up a budget that was based on the house of cards but you know that's the way the world works these days it seems yeah you know so i just was in dubai thursday friday saturday and so when you talk about when the price of oil is high no one complains well i know why they're not complaining because i just saw what they've been building with that oil money over there and it's fa <laughs> it's i mean frankly it's fabulous they've done a fabulous job building out a city i don't know if it's where i'd want to live but i i, I right. really they've done a hell of a job i've seen uh, the photos on your facebook page uh, very impressive yeah they've done a hell of a job hey let me jump into something really basic and i was since we've talked a bunch of times i I've, the real challenge in speaking with you is because to try and not let you get the feeling of being bored. So, like, how do I how, how do I make sure that I'm giving you something somewhat fresh? Very difficult uh, to do. Very difficult to do. But listen, let's talk about your stomach lining for a second and just go back and just I, – I think this is a good reminder for whether it's the professional out there, the new trader, the new investor – and talk about Tom Basso's stomach lining. And, and if you don't mind also the rush and the devastation, you know, we have that we can have this emotional rush. Oh my gosh, I'm making so much money and I'm losing money, the devastation. But talk about your own stomach lining, Tom. Let's just talk about that, that lining. Well, first of all, my stomach lining seems to be doing just fine as far as I can tell. I have never had any ulcers or anything else. A knock on wood, I guess. In my early trading years, which was well reported in Schwager's uh, New Market Wizards chapter on me, uh, there were some silver trades that went all over the place. That really was catching my attention uh, almost hour by hour. It was pretty much, it was during the hunt, uh, cornering uh, the silver market type episode there. And that was more excitement than I really needed. And I tried to analyze why was I so uncomfortable and how do I stay true to trend following while at the same time dealing with the issue that I've got a position that I want to let my profits run, cut my losses short. But the position that I have now is moving all over the place by tens of thousands a day on an account that just a few months ago was maybe 50000 or or 100000 or something like that. Now it's worth... 400,000 or 500,000 and it's moving up and down tens of thousands a day. That kind of opens your eye a lot and uh, I realized out of that that there's no reason you can't stay true to trend following and stay with the position. You just need to manage the position size. So all I did was figure out ways to volatility adjust and to risk adjust my positions ongoing throughout the trade so that things would become fairly tame and and the stomach lining would be kept very intact there was nothing to get excited about because one day was roughly the same as every other day and that's that's what i learned out of the early trading mistakes and and situations where it really would have gotten to my stomach lining over my lifetime and once we got to trend step days we just automated a lot of that to the point where 
you know, it, it just happened automatically. And the only thing that would affect my stomach lining at that point would be a power outage or, you know, the internet lines go down or, uh, you know, the program's not working properly or something like that. But uh, certainly wasn't the markets anymore. You know, I've seen in many interviews that you've had and going back to our conversations, you've talked about how you would mentally rehearse catastrophic events. And I guess if you've got a position on and it's the wrong kind of position, if you're long and you don't adjust and oil drops 50%, that's a catastrophic event. And I, I saw a great comment from Van Tharp and he talked about that he got a phone call from you once and and you said that you had a disaster the prior day and you you couldn't answer the phone. You couldn't talk to Van, but basically you said it was a planned disaster. So you've been thinking about is when a young man is like, how do I plan for catastrophic events? How do I plan for the unexpected? Because it's going to happen. Right, exactly. And I, I was amazed at how many uh, CTAs, professional traders, did not plan for disasters. We would, once a year at least, have a, what I would call a disaster day. And I would tell everybody ahead of time. So everybody in the company knew what to expect. And I asked a little bit extra out of everybody. And uh, we moved a section of the company to our off-site location to operate in an alternative mode and try to run the company from the secondary location while a certain number of people stayed in the primary location to answer phone calls from clients and things that would come in that would be normal routine business and we didn't want to have our disaster day exercise affecting you know the clients being able to get to you know, to us uh, and, and schedule appointments or talk to us or something. With Van's call, for instance, that wasn't a, a hu hugely necessary, I absolutely, I got to do this right today call. So I put him off because I was trying to make sure we did this exercise. And uh, it required a whole lot of attention because when you're operating on backup equipment, it's it's a little bit more clunky than it would be with your mainstream stuff. So but what we did all day was we started and we, we offloaded data to the backup facility. We put orders in from the backup facility. We tried to call our trading desk from the backup facility. We tried to, you know, look at procedures and things and modify things. Uh, so did we have all the word files and Excel spreadsheets and different things that we needed to operate. And invariably, what you get out of those exercises is a, is a, is a good list of things that you missed or that have changed since last time you did a disaster backup, and uh, you can improve and tighten your operations. I find it amazing to me that some CTAs just have a single operation and they don't have a clue what would happen if, uh, say, the mobile phones went down or if, uh, you know, the Internet goes down, you know, you lose electricity, one of your trading desks is no longer available for some reason. There's so many different scenarios, but if you've actually gone through some of them and actually tried to tell your trading partners what you're doing, uh, I always found that they were very, very, very excited in working with me to generate ways of operating in an emergency because they they have the same problem on their side. They want to know that I'm going to be able to deal with what happens to me. And in some of these cases, they were giving us money to trade. So we were trying to, uh, you know, be good partners. And I think that's something that you can do in a lot of aspects of life. Uh, it's amazing how many people just kind of let life put it to them. And then there's the stress of dealing with it, as opposed to trying to say, well, I could go this way, and those following two or three things could happen, or it might not happen, and it might be this. And if it is, you know, do I go to plan B, or do I try to solve that problem? There's a lot of things you can do if you think ahead a little bit, do a little planning, do a little exercising, and then it's not so stressful when it happens. Those catastrophic events, though, it's not necessarily only what you've just described. Thinking in terms of catastrophic events is also about your portfolio, your trading strategy. Sure, it is. And so to some extent, you know, the, the, probably the most catastrophic move that I ever saw was when we in, invaded um, Iraq during HW. Uh, when we went from Kuwait into Iraq those years. When I was, let's see, closing down the markets, I think the oil was at $32 a barrel. We were long. By 8 o'clock that night, we had had a bit of a computer issue at, at the Trendstat, and I was staying late that night. I left uh, having solved the problem at about 8 p.m., which would have been, well, you know, six hours or more after the close. 
and oil was up to $40 a barrel, and we were rolling into Iraq. So I thought, oh, this is ought to be pretty nice. And I go to sleep, and I come in the next day, and oil is at $22 a barrel, and we're, you know, we're stopped out and take a chunk of a loss. I think we lost in all the portfolios about 5 or 6% of the whole portfolio that day, which was to that day and to this day the largest single-day loss that I saw uh, in uh, trading the futures markets. So, I mean, and we made it back, and we were at new highs a month or two later, three months later. Uh, it wasn't any big deal, but it was... It was wow, six <laughs> percent in one day. That's interesting. It wasn't something that was unusual because, uh, yeah, we we saw what the markets did. It was a bad day, but you can recover from a six percent loss. It's not going to hurt you. And we had managed that position properly. It had gotten very volatile, so we were down to minimum size positions. When it got down to twenty two, a lot of accounts couldn't even own a position because the volatility was too great. So we would keep them out of the position altogether. You know, life was good, and we, like I said, came back to new highs shortly thereafter. It sounds so simple, but I think for most people, that simple story can go right over their head. And and the big picture point there is that you're saying, hey, look, we've got to have chips to play the game. Our egos are not so big that we know what's going to happen next. So if the market's not going our way, let's take our losses, get out, and come back to play another day. Exactly right. That's all it is. It's a... It's how do you get to your next 1,000 or 2,000 or 10,000 trades. It's all a matter of statistics. Uh, any one trade can either win or lose. Uh, over time, I usually figured that we were around 33% profitable and about 67% of the time unprofitable on trades. And, uh, of course, the, the winners were worth a lot more than the losers were, so it worked out. But, yeah, you got to come back and do those next 2,000 so that you can get the 33% that are profitable and have to deal with the 67 that aren't. And every piece of media, and of course, media is not relevant to trend following trading, but if you, if you look at media, all media, whether it's print, uh, radio, online, TV, is all about the trade for that day, the trade for that day. And there you just calmly and coolly say, hey, hold on. I don't care about one trade. I care about a thousand trades into the future. That's what I want to be focused on. Well, something that Van Tharp had said a long time ago, uh, and I remember it so well, is a good day for a trader is following your strategy. In other words, trying to get to those next 1,000 trades and just doing what you do over and over again. It's not whether you made money or lost money today. It's whether you followed your strategy today and put on that next set of trades that you're supposed to have put on according to your strategy. And when you get into that mode, then trading gets a little less exciting, your stomach lining feels a lot better, and you'll have more success. You've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years, I think anyone that's, that's been online has seen this, is that you quite enjoy interacting with people, and you're on Twitter, and you're on Facebook, and you weren't doing this a couple of years ago, but now you do, and I, I know you've, you've given a lot of interviews, and you've stayed connected with people, and you clearly really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I, I do think, though, what's interesting is that you have a definite political opinion. And I'm not necessarily curious about the political opinion. I know what it is, and I share a lot of those beliefs. But I think for some people, they could see the political opinions and get confused. They could say, well, well, Tom's got this strong opinion. On that. And they could somehow or another think your trading is living and breathing with your political opinion, and, and it's not. Oh, not at all. Uh, my political opinion... Is that, you know, I think just like trading, where traders have to take self-responsibility uh, to be successful. If, you, if you're blaming uh, the guys on the floor for screwing you on the trade, or if you're blaming your broker for giving you the wrong advice or whatever, you're going to fail. you got to take self-responsibility. You have to be responsible for, finally, for you uh, pulling the trigger on something. And I think that's what I fail to see a lot throughout political life as well. There's a lot of finger-pointing all the time. Something happens, and... You know, so and so is blaming Congress, and so and Congress is blaming the president, and you know everybody's blaming everybody else. And I think they're not looking to themselves and saying, "What could they have done?" You see these parties involved to make that not happen or happen better or whatever. And I think trading's the same way. And so I, I, I view a lot of my political views come from that same bent. 
but it's certainly not it have it doesn't have anything to do with my trading my trading is just purely mathematical and uh if the direction's up, I want to be long. If it's down, I want to be short. It's not any more complicated than that. You know, I've had some I've had some traders on here this fall, current CTAs, uh, running multi billion dollar funds. Really interesting people to talk to, mm-hmm. and I'll get feedback. And they'll they'll come on the show and they'll say, "Hey, we're price driven. We're one hundred percent systematic. This is what we do." And I'll get these emails from people that they're like, "No, you don't get it, Covell. There's a there's a secret fundamental overlay. There's discretion going on in the back room." And I'm just, it still strikes me as funny as it's so many trend following traders just like you will come out and say, "This is exactly what we do." Yeah. There is no fundamental input, and people still think, no, there's a secret sauce of human discretion that you don't know about, Mike, and, and you're missing the point, and you don't realize that Basso has really got a huge fundamental staff in the back room. <laughs> I don't have time. i got to move the five tons of gravel this afternoon. No, you know, I think it comes down to people love to have complicated things. A lot of traders, when they start out, what do they do? They go get uh, Covell's book. You get... You know, Schwager's stuff, you get all sorts, you read, 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 you get a lot of opinions about all sorts of different ways of trading, fundamental and technical, and there's a pattern in the universe type stuff like Elliott Wave and, and Fibonacci and all that stuff, and you you just, the poor trader starting out just looks at all this and just can't figure out what to do next, and the human mind wants to make something as important as making money in the markets a very complicated thing like tom's been around for a lot of years so that's why he's so experienced and that's why he's successful but the reality of it is you know simple things work the best it schwager had a way of saying it it was degrees of freedom in other words the more things you add to a strategy you start out with a simple moving average then you say I'll only do the buy signal and the moving average if the if the if the moon is in the right phase, and then you and then you add on that that you got to have it only on the open, and not any other time during the day, and it's got to meet those criteria. And you start adding filter after filter after filter, and pretty soon you won't do a trade. You'll sit there and look at all this stuff, and you'll first of all be confused because you won't be able to process all that information in your poor brain, and then you'll miss out on trades because. You just can't function. There's so much complicated nature. So you sit there and watch the markets and wish that you could trade, you know, and make some money. And really, simple things are very robust. They will, there's very little about them that can fail because it's so simple. There's not anything but price. Price feeds your profits and it feeds your losses. So if you stay to price with all your strategies, you are uh, strategizing on that variable that feeds directly, one-to-one, your profits and losses. So you never get out of sync. If you're, if you're over there looking at interest rates and trying to predict stock market indices, you've got two different variables going on there. The interest rates may agree with the stock market. They may not agree with the stock market. You could get caught sideways someplace. But if you're looking at stock indexes prices and you're buying and selling stock indices, it's one to one. You know, you're going to make money or, or lose money on what stock indices do, and therefore, you never get out of whack. You're always in sync with the market, and you don't have to stress out of it. You know, Tom, you mentioned traders and overwhelming amounts of information and confusion and different strategies, and you mentioned like Elliott Wave and whatnot. One of the things that I found really useful in wrapping my arms around strategies when I was just a new guy trying to understand as well, was not to necessarily just trust what Tom Basso has to say, but I would look at the performance data. And I could not, for all the strategies out there in the, quote, technical space, I couldn't find any strategy that had this massive number of participants openly putting their performance data out each month, where you could compare those performance data and see that there was often some correlation, maybe not exact, but there was some correlation. And you could wrap your arms and say, oh, wow, trend following has all these participants. They seem to be doing something similar. I feel comfortable about this. This is a useful piece of information for me. Whereas I've never been able to find that kind of overwhelming amount of data for any other technical strategy. It's only trend following. That's correct. And you'll find that the trend followers also tend to lose money at the same time. And I did studies on 
if you took the average volatility, high, low range of, of various commodity markets over a month time, and then looked at the performance of CTAs in general over that same month, you would find a direct correlation to highly volatile months led to larger CTA profits, and lower volatility months led to smaller CTA profits or even losses. And so it made a lot of sense to me that if people are really trend following, you want the market to go a long way. If it's sitting there in one place, you're not going to, you can't make any money if the prices aren't moving. So it was a simple, a simple study and a simple result. And it, and it said exactly the way, it leaned exactly the way that I wanted, that I thought it would lean. That was published someplace a long time ago. It makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if the prices move, then trend followers can make some money. I'm just amazed that so many traders will believe in some type of a strategy and they can't find other market participants actually using this. So they, they, they decide on their lonesome, I have this one novel strategy and they must think in their own mind, well, it's worth more to me because I'm the only one doing it. Whereas I'm like, hold on, I want to see that some other smart people before me have done this. Well, that'd be nice, but so I, I, I can't say that trend following is the only way that you could possibly make money in the markets, but this certainly is one that has been tried and tested by a lot of different you know, minds over the years. you got to say that it's certainly a, a sound way to approach things and to keep yourself from getting in harm's way too awfully much. Hey, let me. I'm gonna have a couple more questions on you. I let you go move some gravel around. That, that's that. that <laughs> I, no, I mean, I'm 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 off to yoga after. Well, while you're doing gravel, I'm gonna do yoga. So okay. <laughs> uh, we'll see who sweats more. <laughs> hey, you, years ago, your firm did a study, and people can still find it online. And I think there's some big picture points to it that still are relevant to this day, which is the hot hand type issue, and specifically for people that put money with trading managers. And they often want to put the money with the manager, and specifically, let's talk about trend following traders, but they want to put the money with the manager when they've had this great run. And, and they, every, and it's, just the, it's the human condition, behavioral economics, behavioral finance. Now I want to give the money. Whereas, I think in your study, why don't you explain what you found out? It's a little bit different than what people think. Well, what I found out was that the two studies together, the, the prices move, therefore trend followers make money. So trend followers making money means their equity curve gets better and better. So the trends persist for maybe several months. Maybe the you know trend followers are now knocking it out of the park. So then all the money in the world starts rushing in and floods in there. And then the markets start stalling out of those trends. Trend followers go into a sideways or a drawdown. Then at the bottom of the drawdown, at the uh, the pit of you know the, the the trough of the equity curve at the low of the drawdown the markets are now going sideways and are about to break out up or down or whatever but they're just building pressure waiting for it to explode and that's when people are pulling money out just before the next big surge and so uh, what i found is that when you took the dollar weighted return which is the actual the returns that the CTAs would have provided had you just put your money with them and left it alone versus the, excuse me, the time-weighted return. I got that wrong. The time-weighted return was what the CTAs would do if you just left it alone. The dollar-weighted return takes into account clients giving the CTAs money at certain times and taking it out at other times. The time-weighted return, which is the CTAs' actual returns by their strategy, were always better than the dollar-weighted returns of what the clients did in terms of coming in and going out. So clients were actually hurting their performance across the entire industry. And I forget whether it was 100% of the cases or some very high percent. It was at least 75%. I can't remember the exact study results now, but it was a huge, overwhelming preponderance and certainly averaged over the whole industry. It was definitely hurting to have clients put their money in or take money out. They were hurting themselves. Now, I find so interesting, and we might have even spoken about this before, is that so many aspects of successful trend-following trading have the understanding of behavioral economics, behavioral finance, and how to deal with biases and using heuristics to trade. 
long before it was a popular subject, long before the Nobel Prizes were handed out, there's this group of traders that were essentially, while not promoting the idea that, hey, we understand behavioral economics, were effectively trading in a way where clearly they understood what all the academic research that was to follow in the decades to come. Mm-hmm. The turtles. Every, I mean, you, I mean, you, I mean, all, many of your peers. Yeah. I mean, it was just, is fascinating, you know? Well, yeah, all I'm doing is saying, you know, if the crude oil market's going down, it's not up to Tom to figure out how or why it's going down. It's simply going down. It is. And uh, and what would you want to be positioned today if you had your choice? Would you rather be positioned in enjoying the downslide or would you be trying to jump in and saying low is low and maybe it's going up from here? I, you know, to me, if the trend is down, I just want to be short. And when it turns around and goes the other way, I want to be long. I don't really want to think too much about it. I've got other things I'd rather think about. And uh, I think that that's reacting to the behavior of a whole bunch of, a whole market full of traders that may or may not be using fundamentals or hedge techniques or whatever they're using to make their decisions, but the aggregate all feeds into that price, it makes it go up, makes it go down. So it's the, it's the dependent variable of all that behavior decision-making of all of those rest of the market, and I'm just reading it in the price and going with it and not thinking too much more than that about it. You know what I love that you just said is I've got, and we can kind of go this direction with the rest of our conversation. I think it's some of the most important stuff. It's very personal. I got other things I would rather think about. And I think what that really says is to people that are paying close attention, hey, my name's Tom. I have this system. I've done the homework. I've done the research. I know why it works. I'm comfortable with it. And then once it's in place and I I put my machine in place, I'm not running around like a a chicken with his head cut off, you know, all nervous and antsy all day long. And as you said, I got other things I'd want to do. And I think what that really says, though, too, is that life is short and you've got to find ways to enjoy your time and have fun. But the idea of of sitting around and staring at a screen and talking trading all the time, trading is just it's a useful byproduct of a process of a machine. But. I, you know, I could tell you don't really care. It's not what you are. It's something you know how to do, but it doesn't define you. Yeah, I mean, I, I know how to golf, but I don't consider myself necessarily a one-dimensional golfer, and I don't live and die, you know, but whether I can get to the golf course. I haven't touched my golf clubs thanks to the cruise to Tahiti. Uh, I haven't touched them in about three and a half weeks now, and I'm still enjoying life. I, you know, it's not like I need to get over there and hit balls right after we get off the phone. I think a lot of people get into trading and they, they get addicted to the, almost the gambling nature of it all. To me, it's just managing my portfolio. It, the less time I can take to do it, the more time I have to move gravel or talk to you or prune my backyard or you know go hit golf balls. And there's lots of things. Or, or take a cruise to Tahiti. A lot of people won't take vacations because they're afraid they're going to miss something in the markets. I just take along my computer and I go do about 10, 20 minutes a day on the ship's uh, satellite internet and I'm done. That's not too burdensome. You know, what you just said there I think is so terribly important. So many people run their lives afraid they will miss something. And I think that is what's happened in modern society is especially with the media coverage, it's all built around a, a really – intense fear Mm -hmm. yeah and i think they're going to miss something so if they're making decisions based on what did the fed decide today then they're glued to the screens trying to you know wait till what the fed decision is coming up i've got to stop sitting there if the fed decision causes the market to go through my stop then i get executed i find out about it when i close the markets down in the afternoon which i'll probably do after our call it's not something i'm going to sit here and want to you know wait until the fed decides to publish their darn report that means i'm sitting here all day long in front of a computer that that's not quality of life but tom can't but can't you listen to the fed and and use some extra discretion to improve your trend following performance no i cannot (laughs) (laughs) i cannot so i just don't (laughs) I, i did enough studies that in the early years that talked about 
what value did my discretionary decision making make and you know, overlaying it on trend following or anything and I became clearly convinced that I was not adding any value so then therefore why I just fired myself basically <laughs> I love it I love it I mean you're, you know I think it's so fun talking to you is because you just are so you're so clean meticulous and precise about about your thinking, about your process, your system, your machine. And I just know some people will listen and they're just going to go, oh, Tom doesn't know that w we can improve what he's doing. It can get better. Almost like the $6 million man, we can we get better, faster, <laughs> stronger. Well, that might be, but uh, you got to remember I'm 62 and retired and enjoying life, so I don't want it you know, create a job out of this. Certainly there's things I could do to try to improve what I'm doing. I'm sure I if I had a team of computer programs like I did back in the old days at Trendstat, I, I probably have a couple of ideas I could work on, but you know, it's just not worth spending that kind of money and effort and then trying to pick up a few extra percent here and there. It's just not what I do today. So I keep it simple and I, I keep it low fixed overhead and uh, I have zero regulation fees at this point. I have very little to no chance of somebody suing me like I did in the old days. You end up with a low liability, easy to run retirement type of investment strategy and that fits my situation and my dollars and my expertise level and, and that's what every trader should always get to is examine themselves and their capital and their expertise. Design the strategy around those things not around what Tom Bossa does or Michael Colville does or anybody else. Everybody out there needs to do what they need to do for themselves. That's what creates the success because then they can, they can do it over and over again with ease. If you're trying to copy somebody else, you're just, you're not going to ever be at ease with that. You're, you're always going to be trying to compare yourself to that person or try to do things that are not in your expertise levels or maybe you don't have enough capital for or who knows. But if you design what you're doing for yourself, then that's where success lies. We kind of talked about this last time a little. I can I get emails from young people all the time, and they want advice on where can I go to get hired in the CTA space, the trend following space? Who will hire me? What what insight can you give me? And I think stories like the turtle story, for example, has really created – and now that since the story is so well known, people think, well, this is going to be, I can, I can recreate this. I can replicate this. I, if I can just get my toe in the door. Whereas I, I think you have some different perspectives about the managed money space today. Why don't you talk about that and maybe offer some advice to a young person today that wants to trade and maybe give an alternate view on ways to go about it versus the ways that people have seen in the last 20, 30, 40 years, maybe you might have a point that things have changed from your perspective, and maybe there's another way to go about it. Yes, clearly, if you took today's world and you took Tom, personally me, I could not do today what I ended up doing back in the 70s and 80s, starting up Trendstat and becoming successful doing all that. I don't think that would be a reasonable path to success in today's world. There's too many billion-dollar money managers with extensive staffs. I have no idea what their criteria is to hire somebody, but I would dare say it'd be hard to get on with a lot of those folks, I imagine. And I think because of the regulation increasing, the cost of doing business increasing in the CTA space, an easier approach to learning how to trade is to probably become your own trader and continue to work very hard at whatever it is that you did before trading, you know, your main job, so to speak. I, I was a chemical engineer in the old days, so work hard at chemical engineering, let's say. Save as much money as you can. Keep building your portfolio bigger and bigger and keep building your expertise in trading bigger and bigger. At some point, you'll be making enough money to uh, look at your trading success and say, you know, I'm making as much money off of trading as I am being a chemical engineer. Maybe I don't need to be a chemical engineer anymore. And then you transition, and then you're where I am right now, trading full-time. I think the, tr the CTA space has gotten to be very difficult to break into, and I'm really at a loss at this point, partly because I've been out of the business for 11 years, but also just because I, I can't quite see my way clear of how would you go about doing that. That's You definitely would need uh, capital infusions or partners that would 
be able to bring in sizable amounts of assets to trade, be able to finance a staff of five or ten at least, lots of you know the phone systems, the computers, the regulatory environment, all the prospectuses, and some of those prospectuses you can blow fifty, hundred thousand dollars really quickly uh, with legal expense. So audits and CPA fees, it's it's getting to be a pretty tough game to just break into for a, a little guy operating out of the garage. But that doesn't take away from the fact that if you want to trade, trade your money or friends and family or something to that effect, that opportunity is wide open. You're you're not saying trading is tougher to break into. You're saying what we've all read about, it, it, the managed money is tougher. The managed money is very tough today. And the, the business of being a CTA is tough. Trading your own money is free of regulation. It's very low overhead. The commissions now... Where in the old days, having being a manager, you could negotiate your commissions and the retail public had to pay a higher brokerage fee. Now everybody pays low brokerage fees. So there's almost no cost to trading these days. And you really can, as a small operator, do things that the big guys almost can't do. I never used to trade orange juice a whole lot when I was at Trinstat, but I trade it now. Because I can. <laughs> I'm, so small, I'm a small dollar size compared to what I used to be, so I don't have to worry about it. I can go into markets that I did, did, didn't go into before very much. And so I think there's you have to examine as an individual trader, do you want to go and work at a CTA because you're trying to pick up expertise? Well, what if their expertise is, is bad? Maybe... I mean, I remember in the day, uh, John Henry was one of the big guys. Say you got a job at John Henry. Well, he was going up and down with 40% drawdowns. Yeah, he traded billions of dollars. I don't think what he was doing made a super amount of sense to me. I thought it was probably always going to lead to very large drawdowns and run-ups because he was more leveraged. And maybe if you go work for somebody like that, he's teaching you that type of stuff. You're learning bad habits, maybe. So there's, it's not a panacea to go to work for somebody else and learn what they're doing. I think it's better for you to learn how to do it on your own and trade your own stuff successfully. And then then you're right where you need to be. You just need to try to find ways of getting more capital to trade. And that means working harder, taking a second job, doing getting a, maybe a degree to get a promotion, uh, you know, getting that next rung up on the ladder in the corporate world so that you can have more money to put away. Tom, great wisdom, great wisdom. I, I really like the way how you just lay that out, the, the lack of a panacea. I think a lot of people, they dream and they fantasize about the panacea, but there isn't one. No, there isn't. Becoming uh, a trader to, to get to where I am right now where I'm trading my own account, living off of it, that is something that is difficult enough to get to no matter where you're no matter where you're starting from, unless you're starting from uh, like a major inheritance, you've got all the money in the world, you know, that would be uh, an easier time transitioning. But if you're starting from uh, where I started as a guy out of college with a four thousand dollar student loan and a chemical engineering job in zero net worth, uh, or negative net worth actually, I think you you have to realize that uh, it's a tough road no matter which way you go. Tom, I'm thinking the best place to send people to check you out, uh, to maybe connect with you, Basso underscore Tom, which is your Twitter handle. Is that the best place? Probably f Facebook I look at more. Uh, I put stuff out on Twitter because then it's attached to Facebook and it goes to both places. Uh, but those are usually my market directional calls. Uh, I try to do that to just keep my friends and family informed of which way I'm leaning. And it is what it is. Uh, I noticed I was, what, two, three days late when I was down in Tahiti on the cruise because of the bad bandwidth. So I had gotten a, a cell come in, and then I got whipsawed on it because it made new highs again. Apologize for people who are trying to follow that, but I recommend you don't follow it. Use it for what it's worth, but it's, it's free and possibly worth about that much. <laughs> And I think that uh, you have to do your own thing and, and create your own indicators. But find me on Facebook is probably the easiest way. I am going to see that probably quicker. Uh, I also, Tom at trendstop.com, my email address uh, is fine. Send me an email. I just had one today from someone who uh, had some questions, and I answered them uh, inside of about six hours. So, Yeah, I do know a lot of people have responded to me and said, hey, Tom's given some great feedback. However, I, I want to tell my audience out there, for those of you that are crazy 
it would make me look bad. If you are crazy, please don't contact Tom. <laughs> if, you, if you really are, if you're not connected to reality and you're gonna and you're gonna ask really really weird questions, please don't go there because it'll make me look bad and Tom uh, won't come talk to me anymore. No, no, no. I, I love talking to you, Michael. No, it's okay. And I can if somebody's crazy, I can uh, figure that out pretty quickly myself. Well, hopefully we can catch up again in 2015. Life's good. Uh, take care of yourself, Michael. It's good talking to you. There you have it. What a fantastic repository of insights from one man. We are all extremely lucky that Tom has been willing to share his wisdom over the years on this podcast. I hope to have him on my show again with new material. Not that any of his material ever gets dated, but I hope to have him on my show again in the flesh for episode number five very soon. Thank you for listening. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.